Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Secular Jihadists for a Muslim Enlightenment. And today's episode is titled, Criticizing Israel, What Isn't Anti-Semitism? So we have a guest who we had before in a completely different context, and he's here again. Uh, But let me just talk first about some of the stuff we're going to be talking about. Recent events that have happened. Uh, Recently, the New York Times had sworn off all political cartoons in its uh, opinion section, Why? Because it was criticized for an allegedly anti-Semitic cartoon um, that it published that got a lot of criticism uh, from pretty much both sides of the aisle. Um, And then also, recently, Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez, Cortez, Cortez, uh, Cortez, the the, the congresswoman uh, from New York, um, has received both praise and criticism for referring to the border detention camps, you know, where the Trump administration is separating children from their their parents and so on, um, as concentration camps. Uh, so she's been panned for this, and she's also been uh, supported for this. And uh, these are the controversies that we're dealing with right now in the world we live today. So there are conservatives and liberals. They're increasingly pointing fingers at each other, calling each other anti-Semitic. Um, and, you know, so we want to talk about, is the term becoming meaningless? What's the threshold for something that is anti-Semitic? What makes something anti-Semitic or not? Um, and this when is it is going to be one of our spiciest episodes, <laughs> by the way. Yeah, let's let's see. Um, so uh, today we're actually joined by um, the filmmaker and a very good friend of ours, Jay Shapiro. He is the uh, director and he's the one who made Islam and the Future of Tolerance, uh, the documentary uh, about uh, with uh, Majid Nawaz and Sam Harris. And um, he's here to join us and he is Jewish. He had a Jewish upbringing. <laughs> and- I mean, if the name didn't give it up, I don't know. What yeah. Else. Yeah. yeah, but that's, it's important because you have your Jew license ready for us. Did you pick it up? Did you bring <laughs> yeah, yeah, it up so. for the episode? <laughs> it's uh, it's expiring pretty soon, I think. We'll, we'll oh, talk no. about it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But let's, so let's I'm talk about getting it. kicked course, out of the club. <laughs> yeah, but, but of course he he is uh, he's secular. I mean, he's 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 one of us. So first of all, Jay, I wanted to welcome you to the podcast and say thank you very much for everything that your people are doing uh, in Hollywood, <laughs> the media, the finance industry. I think you guys are yeah. uh, and for sponsoring your show. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just make sure you send the check pretty soon, or else you know. You'll Wait, get, uh, it works the other way around. You're supposed to send the check. You're you're funding us. Yeah. You're the, oh, oh. You're not you're not doing properly. I'm Shapiro. doing it totally, totally yeah. wrong. This this, this joke, way, by this the way. This run, been, right. Yeah. yeah. This running Since joke, by the way, that we're starting the show with is actually like is probably a really serious topic that we'll get into of the yes, like. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 So, so the first thing I wanted to say, Jay, is like recently, and I, I want to get into your your upbringing and mm-hmm. how you were raised and all that. And we're going to talk about some of the things that we were taught, like me growing up in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, yeah. Armin growing up in Iran, about you know Jews and the kind of uh, sort of stereotypes that we were fed growing up and indoctrinated with. So, uh, first of all, you were very vocal about uh, the New York Times cartoon. So let me just. Well, actually, do you want to go ahead and describe it, the New York Times cartoon that was... Describe it, yeah. I mean, let's see, I have it in front of me here. If, no, if nobody's seen it, it was Donald Trump wearing a, a yarmulke and uh, dark glasses. I guess he's presumably supposed to be blind here. And his seeing eye dog is a small dog with the face of Benjamin Netanyahu and a collar that's blue with the Star of David as the collar. It's also a dachshund, which I've heard is is part of the reason why it, it, it is on anti-Semitic tropes, is that the, the, the breed of dog is also a... Uh, a part of the story, apparently. So yeah, that that's the cartoon. Um, I, mean, I was I was vocal about it. I don't know. I don't know where you want me to start with my my vocality so about what, it, or where we should even get into this. So 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 well, the implication was that basically Netanyahu is uh, the seeing eye dog that's leading Trump. Trump is going wherever Netanyahu wants him to go. Trump is blinded, right? Yeah, there there it is. So people who are watching this, they can see the cartoon. Otherwise, we've described it. We'll put a link to it in the in the description mm-hmm. as well, and. Um, you know, so he's just being led, and it's a whole idea of you know Israel is telling the U.S. what to do, and the U.S. is kind of following blindly. And Trump is obviously populist; he likes going around and pleasing everybody, um, especially if it riles up his base. So th- that was a whole point of the cartoon. So what is the controversy was that this is anti-Semitic? It was routinely right. banned, and and you, I think, disagreed, right? Well. It's not, you know, my challenge, was, I put out a challenge, is where I was vocal with it is, I guess I'll start here, is that I worry about as, as, as a, much a, a theme on your show as anything else about blasphemy taboos and subjects which cannot be criticized. It's just sacred and you can't touch it. And my worry, and that this will, you know, I'll, I'll save my upbringing, but this is not a new worry for me. The worry that 
a particular blasphemy taboo is arising, if not already just entrenched in mm. society on this particular topic. And when I say this topic, it's my challenge that I put out initially was pretty targeted. It wasn't just, um, you know, draw a cartoon that criticizes Israel or even the U.S.'s relationship with Israel that that won't get panned as anti-Semitic. It was a specific challenge of the the criticism of the influence of or by or from the religious sect in Israel, the religious community in Israel, that influence as sort of manifest through the Israeli government and then through American politics, draw a cartoon that criticizes that specific pipeline without getting called an anti-Semite. That is still an open challenge. Nobody has sort of arisen it, it, to me. Um, and I don't, but, and I don't know, because you could read this, this cartoon in a lot of different ways. If you think it's anti-Semitic and you think it's the tropes, uh, my specific which challenge tropes? is... tropes? I don't okay. see any tropes. Well, so I've heard, uh, well, like I said, the dog is, is German. So, well, okay, the, the trope is this. Is, is if we define anti-Semitism, I think Barry Weiss is writing a book about this. And it's spoken pretty eloquently about the specific... Um, odd nature of anti-Semitism as being more than just a bigotry against a certain uh, group of people based on their ethnicity, etc. It's also a conspiracy theory about the Jews controlling the world and being the secret puppet masters behind everything, this right? is the, the Rothschilds. This, this exact opposite of that, so th this doesn't even fit to that trope. This cartoon. I, I think the people it who are reading so. it as anti-Semitic are reading it that way of like, look, like... <laughs> The, the Jews controlling the world and everyone else is sort of uh, the word like hypnotized by them. Again, it, people have to read into this a lot. I don't I, I don't know what the word anti-Semitic means. People are freaking out about cartoons. But if that's what you think it means, that's the trope that I think they are leaning on. But that would, makes it, should it shouldn't have been the other way around to feed in that trope. Shouldn't shouldn't have been Netanyahu holding the, uh, Trump on a leash for that to be more uh, close to that trope. Honestly, I don't yeah. know. Honestly, yeah. like, I don't know, because I, I ask them. People, everyone freaked out and wrote articles and, like, you know, lost their shit over this cartoon. And my challenge was, like, okay, what about it as anti-Semitic? And if they could give me an answer, I'm like, okay, change that. Does that make it any better? Um, you know, I, I don't know. What do you want to change about this cartoon that still holds that same criticism and then no longer makes it anti-Semitic. That's my challenge to people. I had a couple people okay, so, try. I don't know what it is. Yeah. And so how, how is it different? So let's let's contrast this because I think that some of the differences are very subtle. Um, and I I look at this. I think that the Star of David thing kind of uh, really got people. If that wasn't there, it's a flag of the country. Like what and, you know, like what and, are you supposed to do? But right, yeah, and that and that makes it a complicated thing. If as well. you don't want if you don't want people to uh, to attack your religion while they're attacking your country, maybe stop putting religious symbol in your f freaking flag. Maybe that's your 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 problem. <laughs> it makes right. it a hard job for the cartoonist. That's for sure. Right. It does, yeah. So, and, and first of all, I, th I think cartoons. It started a conversation, and this is, I, I think it is a, an interesting conversation. I mean, it's kind of out in the open. Ilhan Omer, right? So she also talked about how you know the influence of Israel on the U.S. Right? So Trump moving the capital to Jerusalem. You know, uh, he's backing Netanyahu in a way that previous Republican and Democratic administrations haven't done since since Lyndon Johnson's administration. The U.S. both Republican and Democratic parties have been opposed to settlements. They've been opposed to settlement building and settlement expansions in mm -hmm. the West Bank. Um, just universally, Zionists are also opposed to. I I've met so many Zionists that are opposed to settlement. Right. Yeah. So, so so the thing is, you know, th there was this issue, and then. Um, uh, you know, recently there's been a, a lot of appeasement, I guess, from the Trump administration uh, to Israel. And uh, when anybody criticizes that, I guess, the way that Ilhan Omar did it is she had that tweet that said it's all about the Benjamins baby. That's, you know, what she said, that oh, wait, it's the money it. that the Jewish lobby is uh, buying out American politicians who support Israel. And uh, that was an anti-Semitic trope. And I, I kind of agree with that. I think that that does bring up an anti-Semitic trope. But what, what do you... What do you yeah, there you, you go. Okay, so do you really think this is okay? I I don't I'm actually don't like Elon Omar as a politician, but I think that some of the attacks are on her are exaggerated. Is this anti semitic Like, I mean, isn't yeah. she like, like, can we not talk about like if if lo we had lobbyists, right? Like, if we attack um, um, Saudi Arabia's uh, 
you know, lobby groups uh, that are, you know, you know, it is all about the Benjamins, but it's not just Israel. It's also Saudi Arabia. It's also yeah, many other. That, even that, Iran that, has managed to get lobbyists. Right. Which, that, that tweet, it's all about the Benjamins, baby, should be just evergreen all the time in a capitalist world. Like right. everything's about the Benjamins and it's probably. Uh, good it is. Right. How is but, this anti-Semitic? But, but, but can it, I, I think yeah. it's we've gone just a little bit into this conversation, but it's like we should probably put a pin okay. in the specific um, <laughs> the specific phenomenon of anti-Semitism given the Holocaust. And it's yes. just like, because I've written about a lot about this too, it's like I, in that little thought experiment, and this is what, uh, on a pure sort of intellectual level, you're right. Like, can I make a cartoon that says like, oh, by the way, Saudi oil is a huge influence over American policies. Like, of course, like that's obvious. I could probably get away with that cartoon. Depending on how I did it, I wouldn't get accused of, of anything. The, you know, people, people who see the cartoon of, of the dog and that Netanyahu have these images of like Nazi propaganda that would show Jews as dogs and this kind of, like you could always find a Nazi cartoon that like looks a little similar to any kind of criticism of Israel. Mm -hmm. It's And then, and then it just like, you know, it, it, it triggers. Wait, Ar Armin, dog? hold on. No, 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 but, you, let okay. you finish. No, 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 I mean, you could probably, you could probably find it in the, you know, these are conversations I, I've had with, with people in my family about this particular cartoon who kind of just like, it's almost in this way where like they can't put their finger on it. They're like, it just feels anti-Semitic. Although when you, when I do the kind of thing I do of pressing them to be like, well, what would you change to make it non anti-Semitic? They actually, they can't come up with anything. They're like, I think it's the dog. I'm like, okay, if I make the dog into like <laughs> a cat or something, does that make it better? Like, I, you know, you start changing the variables and they're just, it's, mm. it, that's why I think it's a taboo, and it just has become a blasphemy of like this. You just can't touch this subject, period, right. because it's, we're still too some, close to the Holocaust. Yeah, yeah there's some nostalgia. So you you tell me not to interrupt. Now you're doing. Oh, okay, it. okay, Armin, you go first. Go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. But I'm just saying it's not just me. <laughs> so you know, I was feeling this like a nostalgic sense from uh, our part of the world, where you know you had cartoons and you had like a big controversy over cartoons unfortunately yeah. much more deadly than this um and the second thing is that there was uh, also that blasphemy taboo you're talking about where criticizing islam islamophobia there's this whole issue that anybody who challenges the doctrine of islam in any way is being uh, islamophobic or being an issue even if the, if it's genuinely problematic and and the thing is that what we're seeing with netanyahu is uh, you know a lot of this is it isn't even about israel it's about netanyahu i mean right. netanyahu would not get he had to an unprecedented unprecedented um, election result where he could not form a majority government because he doesn't have enough support from his own people in the party. Are they all anti-Semitic because <laughs> they they oppose his uh, his policies? Um, so it's it's a pretty fascinating thing that's going on. Yeah, um, the, the difference. I mean, the, the simple the simple retort that always comes my way and everyone's way after you see this kind of thing is like there's a way to be anti-Israel or criticize Israel without being anti-Semitic. Um, or the people who say there is no way like this, this is an ongoing conversation. And my challenge is just like, well, of course there's a way and mm. show me, but, but mine's a little more specific of like criticizing Israel's policies without being anti-Semitic should be pretty easy, but criticizing this, what this, what this author is trying to do, what this illustrator is trying to do and what Ilhan Omar was trying to do in that tweet is criticize a, something more specific than just Israel has a right to exist or not exist or whatever, or it's expansionist policy. It's a pretty narrow criticize the religious rights. Um, again, I, like I'm being careful with my words. I don't want to say stranglehold. I don't want to say hypnosis. Hypnosis. I want to say influence because that's the fucking word in the dictionary. Yeah. Influence yeah. that that goes through a certain pipeline. This isn't like a conspiracy theory. It just is what it is that manifests itself in American politics and in a lot of foreign policy. Criticize that pipeline. Is there a way to do that without being anti-Semitic? That seems to be damn near impossible right now. And you know, Armin, you were just there. Yeah. The, if you're going to try to criticize something like settlements and the expansionist policy and maybe the, let's say, one state solution uh, fever dreams of someone like Netanyahu to, to sort of just like take the West Bank or whatever it is, if you, if you think that's sort of a thing, you've seen the settlements. You tell me the kind of people who would actually want to live in those settlements. These are not people like you and me. These are not no, like these are people 
who I would I would say are pretty much religious maniacs. Like, have you you've seen them? Like, you've seen the settlements in the West Bank and what they well, actually look like. Yeah, well, they, not- they're getting they're getting better, but they're doing like they're sending a lot of security there. They're making their there's a lot of you know advertisement about them and yeah. of, but they're these trying are not to, like living no. in like like Orange County. Like this this is <laughs> these are these are very. You know, these are places where only a certain kind of personality would live there. And probably right. the people who you met who are Zionist and very anti-settlement probably mm. look at those people like, these people are fucking lunatics. Mm. Right. But they think there's only a religion. They only, they think the the secular Zionists, they think this is all about religion. And the settlement well, is not, not about security. And those people, the, the people who are living in the settlements are quite... You, if nobody, If you build a settlement and nobody comes, like... This is that's a problem, especially if you're Netanyahu and, and you want to like he's now in the Golan Heights thing is like going to name a town after Trump there or something one day. Oh like my if you, God. If, right. Yeah. If, you, if you build a settlement and nobody comes, that's a pretty like that's a that would be a bad look, certainly yeah. for Israel or for anybody <laughs> with us. So who is going to live in these places? You kind of this is this is, again, not a conspiracy theory, but you need somebody to live in them. So mm-hmm. the religious Jews or the or, or the Jews who are willing to live in those places, let's just call them Israelis. Israelis who are li- willing to live in those places are very, very useful polit- politically to Netanyahu. Like yeah, that, yeah. I don't. That, that shouldn't be a controversial statement. And so that usefulness manifests itself. And and if this cri- if this cartoon isn't really sharply criticizing that as well as it could, you could you could say it's not a great cartoon as far as its effectiveness. But it, to me, that's what it's trying to do. There's obviously you know a lot of there's a lot of talk about people on the left wing and the kind of anti-Semitism, mm-hmm. which isn't as overt as the as the uh, neo Nazis that marched in Charlottesville, you know, the Jews will not reply to us and blood right. and soil, that, and the swastikas. But they are, um, there's another kind of really sort of insidious anti Semitism uh, that's associated with people like Jeremy Corbyn, you know, the head of the Labour Party in, in Britain, um, also uh, with uh, Ilhan Omar, and also with, uh, you know, so the, the Alex, so AOC, let's just call her AOC, that name's about. <laughs> yeah. uh, so she um, recently tweeted and she talked about. How uh, the 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 cages or, or the places where the detention centers where the kids uh, yeah. that of the undocumented workers or asylum seekers at the border are coming to in the U.S. they're being separated from their parents. We've all seen those stories. I mean, they're obviously heartbreaking. Um, but she called them concentration camps. Now we had uh, Mike Godwin, right, who came up with Godwin's law or Godwin's rule, and he said he basically his rule was that on the internet, pretty much everything after a little while uh, will devolve into a comparison with the Nazis and the Holocaust, number mm-hmm. one. And the second thing is that, and, and when that, um, uh, yeah, and, and when that happens, I can't remember what the second part of it was, but he, he was basically the whole idea was everything is compared to the Holocaust and then the yeah. whole thing disintegrates and your argument isn't valid anymore. That was a whole implication. No, that's but, not the implication. That's not that's not Godwin's law. Godwin's law is not that you're wrong to compare it. The Godwin's law is that at some point you're going to compare it. Yeah, at no, some point somebody. It's, it's not a, people. People confuse it yeah. with the logical fallacy. Nobody said it's a logical. It's a it's a it's a Godwin law, not the Godwin fallacy. <laughs> yeah, I know, no, but but Godwin also said there is a second part of it, and it's yeah. it's it's that uh, when it devolves into that, then you have lost the argument. Really? And that, that, yeah, yeah, no, I don't. I didn't. I mean, I think it's kind of a joke. So I, I think we. It, it is a joke. Yeah. It's not a real law. It's but a bullshit like Godwin, ruled it. <laughs> I have to say, in 2017, on August 13th, and this is around the time the whole Charlottesville thing was happening, uh, he tweeted, this is from Mike Godwin himself, mm. the creator of the law, quote, by all means, compare these shitheads to Nazis again and again. I'm with you, end mm. quote. So Godwin has kind of uh, <laughs> gone because <laughs> he's, he's given Godwin himself. Yeah, yeah, from Godwin himself, the, from the from the mouth of Godwin. Anyway, so, so that. So I don't think that's part said, of Godwin Law that whoever brings it up has lost and lost. Oh no, no, that that is it's Armin, more that like is, a, th- uh, think of it more like a drinking game. Whoever brings it up loses the drinking game because exactly. it's, it's, it's a, if, if if people think this is a whoever brings it up has lost, they, that's wrong because for, because the thing not is lost that the argument but lost the like the, the no, game. No, of, we're talking about what Godwin says. Armin, you have a completely different take on Godwin's law and the cartoon than I thought. <laughs> oh, no, but I'm disagreeing okay, with uh, I'm disagreeing with Godwin right now. Yeah, if yeah, that's yeah. what you're saying, because right. I think okay, move on from Godwin. <laughs> you know, yeah, I really. I, I, this is important for the rest of the discussion because I think it's it's a 
uh, Nazi Germany is the most uh, is the best thing to compare things to because most people know about that history. Most people don't know their history, right? But most people know what happened in you know Germany after you know during World War Two. Most if I compare things to like communism or Stalin, most people or Chinggis Khan, people don't know the details, right? If I if I want an evil, if I want the you know, Hitler is the best one. People know his story. People know what he did. People know what happened in the camps. It's the best thing to compare things to. I don't understand what the. Yeah, but, but that's not the, the point. The point isn't that. His point is that when you make spurious comparisons, like people will be like, oh, you disagree with me. Or, you know, this person, I don't like this politician. Well, he's Hitler. Or, you know, these things are, if you're keeping me restricted in house arrest, that's like a concentration camp. So what they do is they make. Um, disproportionate comparisons, and that's what yeah, he was talking about. But that's a fallacy. Would regard it as what? Of course, of course, it's a fallacy. That's what he's pointing out. That's yeah, a but fallacy. it doesn't matter if it's World War Two or anything else. That's a fallacy, regardless of what you compare something to. Okay. But so, when it comes to comparing things to the World War Two era is the best one because it's the part of the history that most people are familiar yeah, yeah. with. So Jay, so the one thing that Armin is saying that does that, there, I, I think that there is a point. One part of it that I do agree with is that we have that hashtag "Never Forget," right? I mean, mm-hmm. before it was a hashtag, it was a thing. Never forget. So how do you never forget if you can't occasionally draw parallels between something that we don't want to forget and something new that's happening that we want to prevent? You know what I mean? So that's that's another point that I think of sometimes. So I I think that that was kind of the spirit between uh, behind what AOC was doing, but I also think it was oh. obviously disproportionate and it was over exaggerated. So She's, I mean, what's your take on give, it? Yeah, I mean to give her a little credit there, or like room wiggle room is she didn't say Nazi Germany. She's now you know whatever. This is I, I think it's kind of silly because she and Liz Cheney are just acting like children on Twitter. And this is part of sort of like the Trump devolving politics onto Twitter that we take it too seriously. Oh, no, no, like, Jews uh, are a great propaganda tool. That's yeah, all. Yeah, 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 you interrupt as well. And I just I, 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 that was it. That was a okay. Hang on, go on. Uh, Sorry, um, AOC. I mean, if you watch the original clip, she's she's using hyperbolic language to to pull in a comparison to to underline just how outrageous she thinks the the situation at the southern border is. She says concentration camps. Was she thinking of Nazi Germany when she said it? I don't know. But you have to be pretty dense to not assume that a large portion of your audience will think of Nazi Germany when you hear the word concentration camps. So you you know what you're doing there. And I'm not even calling that like, um, you know, that's not even outrageous. She, she's outraged and she's using hyperbolic language. Liz Cheney coming in probably disingenuously, like calling her out by saying that you're, you know, this comparison is is uh, you know like um, she, she, an, an insult to the six million Jews who were exterminated. That's exaggeration it's, as well. It's, it's exaggeration what she was doing, and then AOC doubled down on it and was and did this weird move that I had never heard before of saying using the word exterminate is co-opting the language of your oppressors. So like you're the one who needs exterminate? to exterminate. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah that's wow. what she, it's, like, any, let me bring it on the screen actually. It, it, but the whole thing was really just like a childish, stupid thing. And now we're all arguing about like what the what a concentration camp is instead of actually doing something about the southern border, which probably needs, you know, a lot more attention. Yeah, th- this is their dumb little. Well, you could find AOC's response to it. But yeah, See? this apparently was some sort of, you know, yeah. But like everybody, everybody, like everybody is trying to find their Jew friend to come and agree with them. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we're doing. As well. Yeah, but it, like it's, it's honestly just kind of I think worth ignoring the fact that like I, I just I don't care about their stupid little fight over pulling the Holocaust into this conversation. We should do something about the southern border. Was AOC's language? I think I, I put this in, like in a little tweet that I think Ali you found and liked of like. You know, if she really wanted to dunk on Liz Cheney in some sort of clapback, like Twitter style, it should have been calling her out on like, of course, I was using hyperbolic language. And so are you like, go, go fuck off. Like, that's it. Like, you know, yeah, I I think calling Liz out for being like, you're using exterminate, like you committed some sort of weird uh, crime yeah. against like language. It's just yeah. like this is. And all I think the point you made was valid stuff. in that tweet that I like. It's that you said that you know people use hyperbolic languages and they make these sort of comparisons to make a point and to get people thinking about things, right? So yeah, um, like if, if we're gonna get like, and probably Armin, you'll like this. If you want to get technical and definitional about, because now she's trying to be like it's definitionally a concentration camp. Like I, I find th- this argument really, really annoying, but. 
probably she's like okay if she's right she's right i don't i actually don't care there's got to be a difference between a camp where a where a state rounds up its own citizens puts them in somewhere where they can't leave even let alone extermination versus like an internment camp versus a camp on a border where where people are they could leave presumably and go back to like where they came from like intentional the intentions of the state in camp A versus camp B, that's a that's a dif- that's a distinction that should probably have a different name. I wouldn't use the, w- the word concentration camp to describe what's happening on the border, but their their detention I, camp. I, I, like I don't care what you okay, well, there is Can, a, I, can, there, I, can yeah, I tell what I, can I say what I think? Okay, so I, I don't I don't think it's an, there's an issue with calling it a camp. I mean, the whole argument uh, that people ha- uh, that in, to defend her would be that. Uh, well, you know, Nazi Germany didn't just start with, the, you know, putting people, you know, in, in gas chambers, right? It started something mild there, so we need to always fight these things when they start. And also, if we want to take away yeah. calling things concentration camps, then we can't call the Chi- what Chinese is doing to Muslims, right. In, right? We can't call that concentration camp because they're not putting people in gas chambers right now. But that, that, that is a concentration camp, and we need to, like... No, uh, but call, that, that you, one is. It, like, right. The difference between China and the Muslims because right. they're rounding up their own citizens versus, like, a border where you're... Where exactly. You're like, oh, so... Did Detention People center, yeah, like, it's like a right. Really the, the, horrible the detention prob- center. I think the problem with they're both, I, the, they're both they, terrible. Like, you know, yeah, they're they're terrible, and the situation. I mean, ob- the terrible in different level. Obviously, Nazi Germany way way above all of this. Uh, yeah. What China yeah. is doing to Muslims is way worse than what Trump is right. doing at the border. Way worse. But the thing is that I, my my issue with the border thing is not what they're calling it. Is what what do you expect? I, I don't even know what they expect to happen. Like, do you want them to just let people not just? Uh, you can't so, let them in. You can't let them in. Right. You can't just let them be without I mean, water or food in the desert. The argument so, is that like they're not. You know, they're they're not giving them trials quickly enough. They're not processing. Well, they don't have a enough, budget, so, and the Congress yeah. is not giving them the money. What the yeah, hell are I they mean, supposed the, to do? This is <laughs> Yeah, this is a whole separate issue. And, and AOC is right. We should need to call attention to it, give the budget, do whatever we have to do to process people, treat them better. Like, fine. Like, that's yeah, like a I mean, I'm against topic. Trump, but right now it's the Democrats that are holding the budget to Trump to be able to spend it on these things right now. Well, so, I, I mean, I don't know if that's I don't know if that's particularly true. I might be uh, wrong about that, but let yeah. me know. If, yeah. But, um, but I, what I'm saying is so, that there is not enough. They don't. It's not. This is this is a bad situation. But given the budget and resources that they have dedicated to the border right now, it's the, it's the only thing they can do. The, the the other thing they could have done is just to leave uh, them with a. Yeah, what, yeah. What's the, the only thing they can do? So what, like, what, what are they supposed to do? Just leave them, leave people in in the you know, the other alternative was not to just let them. OK, so. If they cross the border, right? What are you supposed to do? What was your solution? No, no. You have detention centers, but we're talking about separating like infants from their parents for yeah, no that, reason. Yeah, that like, that, that's like I mean, if you that's, see that, that's that, 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 that's insanity. I mean, you've seen the reunion videos there, of these kids coming together. Like, that's, yeah, but that's, do you know there are some people like no, are actually re- renting kids to be able to cross the border. Ar- you have, Armin, they no. have to legally check if they're actually their parents. Like, sure, are, yeah, I know, but that's a. Armin, that's a lot of stuff that they're saying, but there are the vast majority of cases is parents, their biological kids being separated. A lot of them are asylum seekers. Um, the the healthcare. I mean, it's a horrendous situation, and the the administration. Is by, the way, by the way, the administration has admitted that they're yes. doing this as a deterrent to stop people coming. So. Sure, it's fine if you want to turn to stop people coming. That's okay, but to actually separate kids from but, their parents to do that in that way, is, a lot of these people, the people that are coming, the Saudis put, would do. Ali, the yeah. people that are bringing these kids, they are the per- people that are putting them at risk. You, I, I, I would be in favor of a deterrent. They should. Yeah, I don't, I don't Mexico, know. I don't know. Mexico is safe for most of these people. The, Mexico the, is a safe place for most of these people. That's, uh, no, no, they're no, putting no, it. Yeah, Ar- yeah, Ar- yeah, yeah, Armin. I, no, I think that, that's the. Those are the Fox News talking points, Armin. I'm sorry, but I haven't like, watched Fox these forever. People, I've never, I've, I don't watch Fox. No, I know, I know you haven't. But the thing is, like, there's stuff. I, I, I've heard all of these arguments, but I know that uh, I know where the issues are. A lot of these people are running away from situations that are deadly, and they're going into situations where they're being. I mean, I the point is, there's better ways to handle it. In the original country, not in Mexico. 
Okay. Well, anyway, that that's not the conversation that we we're not going to go into that tangent. <laughs> right, right. Last thing, last thing on this topic, George Takei. George Takei is a Japanese American, mm. um, you know, way senior citizen, activist, celebrity actor. Um, so he responded to um, AOC as well, and he said that. Um, quote, I know what concentration camps are. I was inside two of them in America. And yes, we are operating such camps again. And he's talking about when the U.S. rounded up Japanese people and put them in uh, what, what they called them internment camps. Um, but uh, he's calling them concentration camps as well. So there is a... Uh, you know, Obama <laughs> has cages for children. It is a childish like, huh? Huh? Didn't huh? Obama have cages for children as well at the, at the border? They, no. He, let, let, me, no. let me just put... Let, let me put, because this, this goes back to, to Ali's point from a while ago, the danger of all this kind of rhetoric, it's like we've learned nothing. There was a few good articles when Trump won that were, for a minute there, a little self-reflective by the media, kind of reflecting on the language that they have used in the past to describe other elections and other candidates. And uh, this is a simple point, it's been made a lot, but it's probably worth repeating again here, is if you called... John McCain, the devil and the worst candidate ever, and you know the next Hitler, and you called Mitt Romney that. There's no words left. If you've already pulled out Godwin's, you know Trump you, card, you have, yeah, that's a problem. Pun intended. There's nothing left to call Trump, and and people get desensitized to this kind of thing. So I, it's why these conversations in the language is important. That if George Takei is saying that, then um, you know, and he's lived it. He has lived it. He's lived. He's, no, he's, li he's lived it, but he's not living this one. And yeah. uh, you know, I, it, it just it's just like where do you go if you're calling something that it's a hundred percent on the one to zero, uh, one zero to one hundred percent bad scale? Well, then you're at the top, and so there's nowhere left to go. And but it it can clearly get a lot worse than than what's happening at the borders. I mean that that's why what Liz Cheney maybe disingenuously was trying to do was to call out of like come on, this is not Nazi Germany, it's bad, we should do something, but like, let's save some of our language for when that actually happens, so then people will respond. Because it, mm. pe people get very, they get desensitized by hearing, you know, this person's Hitler, this person's Hitler, if everybody's Hitler, then nobody's Hitler. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then never again becomes again, because then Hitler shows up in yeah. a crowd and no one, you don't have yeah. any words left to alert any. It's just boy who cried wolf kind of basic psychology. So that you know, that's why this conversation. Is also, dangerous. okay, uh, and the reason, another reason why this conversation is dangerous is because uh, Jews were living in Germany and Hitler put them in concentration camps. Well, you know, that was their home, and they were arrested. If the if the condition at the border is nearly as these these are people coming right. to United it, States. It matters. These I are agree. people coming to United States. Okay, this is like if if do you think Jews would have gone to a country where there were like there was news that we, they're gassing people and they would have like mass migrated to that country. Like whatever they're coming from is already way worse than whatever they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna have to deal with. No, like I, I, I agree, it, there should be a different word for it. And, and to AOC's credit, she's she's now at least a little bit pulling back. Like, call them what you want, interim camps, whatever. Does that make it? Better? No, no, that's dismissal of not taking. Call them what you want. Like, like I'm not gonna tell. No, listen. Yeah, I think yeah. she already she already made the mistake. And if you look at yeah. the the hero worship that happens around her and the people, like crazily coming her to to her defense over the weird exterminate call out line. Yeah. Right, right. She's she's already done a lot of damage. I'm I'm with you, but like. It, I'm actually we, more concerned. We don't, with we don't have smart people leading a lot of these really delicate conversations, and it's a problem. I, I think I think right now both sides is interested in finger pointing rather than then getting. I, I think they you know the situation is bad at the border. It's not as bad as most people think, but it's still very bad, right? Uh, but they need to send money to it, and they need to go and make the conditions better, and they need to find deterrence that is not other deter like they need deterrence, but not deterrence that involves people suffering, right? Sure. The, the, right. the best deterrence, of course, we know is that it would be great if we can, if Guatemala was a great place and they didn't want, because well, that's you, you not, point, in, a, point that's not Mexico, in United States control. Most of the immigrants are not coming from Mexico, you know, they come through Mexico, but yeah, well, it's not in our control, but that would be the, the global be a be That people won't suffer and it's a deterrent. So some people say, well, that's why we need a wall. Mm. No, it, the, the wall should be a part of the conversation, of course. If like if the wall can prevent people from being in a shitty detention center, yeah. And, and this is this is you know that's not sacrilege. That's something that until Trump came along, Democrats talked about. Talked openly. about. They yeah, talked about a fence. Hillary Clinton talked about yeah, having a fence at the border. And so, now and now yeah, it's just right. become so toxic. This oh, we've drifted quite but, but, far but from but the Israel. You know that, yeah, we have. Let's not. 
No, no, but uh-huh. you guys, I just want to show how, how how tribalistic this become. Like, you guys yeah. saw that one thing that went viral was a picture of the kids in cages, mm-hmm. and people were sending it around, they look like what Trump is doing to children, and then they realized, actually, this is a picture from Obama era. Right. Right? So, so that this kind of shows to me that people are just, nobody cares about these kids. People are just, they, they, some of these migrants are using the kids, but also their left and the right are also using these kids. Everybody's just using that. That does kids. not mean, that does not mean it's not happening. That does not mean it's a legitimate Did I say it's not happening? No, no, I know you didn't. I'm right. saying I know that there are people, but I do think that most of the people who are talking about this and concerned about it and outraged about it, they're not just doing it for political purposes. I think most people are using the anti-Semitism thing. I are. think they're doing it for political purposes. They're bringing in the comparisons to the Holocaust. Yeah. They're doing all of that stuff all the time, right? And right. they're doing it for political purposes. But I, I don't. I, I think this is a genuine, like, outrageous issue. This is something that outrages me too. But okay. um, so. So Jay, okay, so let's move back from the border thing, and um, <laughs> yeah, let's. So, so your, yeah, sure. let, yeah, let's talk about your history and um, why you feel strongly about it, your background, um, how you grew up. I mean, you're you're you had a sort of Jewish upbringing. You're, you're yeah. New York Jew. New, 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 oh, well, this, this becomes part of the conversation. Sorry, I was going to say if I even use the term, Jew. huh? No, no, I'm from Pennsylvania. No, oh, you're from Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. All right. So I'll give you a little like crash course because I don't think my uh, story is rare at all, which is why I've also felt compelled to talk about a lot about this. Um, I grew up in Allentown, Pennsylvania. It's just a big suburb close enough to Philadelphia and close enough to New York to sort of feed both. So grew into sort of a mega suburb. Um, if you've seen the movie American Beauty, you're sort of picturing yeah. something in the, in the right in the right vein there. Um, in a con- so what's called conservative Judaism. So the word conservative is a little misleading there, and I know I have to clean that up a little bit. There's sort of three tracks of Judaism generally. I, I know there's smaller sects, but of Reform, or- uh, Orthodox, and then the- in the middle, conservatism. You- conservatism. You could almost view them as sort of just like you know uh, on a gradient of just how how um, you know strict that people adhere to to the the traditions conservative judaism that i grew up in i went to a temple called temple bethel it's like high holidays and occasional shabbat so there's a couple big holidays on the jewish calendar we would show up at them i would go with my dad or my mom we would do dinners like passover the big holidays hanukkah we would do in sort of the american style almost look like christmas style um, and very occasional Shabbat. I had a bar mitzvah. I was also confirmed. Uh, my mom bribed me to, to, to be confirmed by promising to buy me a mandolin if I stuck through it, and she did. So, like, yeah. this is the kind of nice. sort of upbringing I had. I was always an atheist as far as I can remember, and, 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 and that was also easy. My parents also both le- theologically atheists, but very much called themselves Jews. Um, backing up even further, my, I, I guess I'm a third generation American, both. All of my grandparents were born in America, but their parents all were not. I think I've got that right. Or my moms were. My, my fathers weren't. So three and a half generation American. Um, they all left Europe and what is now sort of Ukraine uh, earlier than sort of the Holocaust era stuff and sort of the first wave in the 1900s, oh, 1910s. So Russian a little too. bit. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so sort of the writing on the wall, uh, Jews who, who came over earlier and established their lives here. Um, but there's entire swaths of my family tree of what would be now, I guess, second or third cousins who don't exist and were totally wiped out in Auschwitz and in the Holocaust all over Europe. Mm. Just like almost every other Jewish family that ended up in America, they all have the same stories. I have, um, you know, great, great uncles, or, well, great uncles who, who survived Auschwitz, many who didn't. Uh, so that, that's sort of my upbringing. Um, and uh, I'll fast forward to sort of like what my upbringing looked like in a regular suburb with a with a decent sized Jewish community in Ameri- in Allentown. Um, it, it was I was sort of I was always told I, I'm going to bring this I'm going to bring in the other Shapiro Ben Shapiro and and the the, the tweets that he put you know, out. Your, your cousin, yeah. this. my cousin, yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, uh, uh, unrelated, but but yeah. he. I'll start with this because this is a good way into sort of like what my teenage years may have looked like. When he sat with our, our other good friend Dave Rubin and said, um, you know, like I wouldn't attend an interfaith marriage between a Jew and a non-Jew, even if it was my family member. 
And I, you know, I, like many other people, saw this and was and sort of called out Dave for just sitting there and taking that or not calling that out. Wanted to get into the mind of Ben a little bit. And I maybe snarkily at first tweeted out basically like if you were at a if you went to a wedding and someone told you, hey, cousin Ben's not here because he thinks, you know, this this like secular Jew and this ex-Muslim getting married to each other is a sin. And so he's not here. What would you act? What would you think of Ben? And after some tugging and pulling, most people sort of saw, like, I would think he was kind of a dick for not showing up. But then to be a little more um, generous with what probably is going on in Ben's mind is this, because this is what I was fed growing up, is the ben, cousin Ben is not here because he views interfaith marriage as the biggest threat or one of the biggest, biggest threats to the survival of Judaism in, in the future. Um, and that's really important to Ben. And so he doesn't he doesn't support this because he he thinks this marriage is in some ways adding to the future disintegration of Judaism. And so he just doesn't want to be here. That would be like the nicest way to to frame what's probably going going on in Ben's mind, because when I was growing up, I have a brother, older brother. And when we were sort of getting into like the dating ages, it was always kind of expected that we would end up with a Jew or date Jews. It was never like explicitly demanded of us from our parents, but it was always hinted at. We always knew which one of their friends who was Jewish and not with a Jew. We always somehow knew that in the family. It was always mm. knowledge that was talked about with sort of a, a little, you know, air to the judgy. conversation. A little judgy, a little bit sort of like, oh, you know, cringiness to it. Um, but... And I, to give my parents full credit, they quickly grew out of this when both my brother and I started dating non-Jews in college and afterward who were lovely people. But although I have to say my mom was quite cold to my, my college girlfriend who was not Jewish for a little right. bit before her just – she was an amazing person and her kindness melted her. And my mom is no longer like that. Uh, mm. But, but that, that was uh, – you know, you, And your you, mom that, is religious at all? Well, theologically, totally atheistic. And this is why it's going to be important to like, what does Judaism mean? Is it a religion? Is it an ethnicity? Ooh. And like getting kinds of these, which, which really complicates the anti-Semitism thing. And is a big difference between the, the, the Muslim conversation. Right. Your book, right. Ali, the, the Atheist Muslim, is a, is a title that like is either funny or snarky or, or optimistic, but writing a book called The Atheist Jew is like... It's reality. Know, yeah. it's, re it's reality, right? So, like, that's a conversation, and, and we'll talk about, I can tell you why and what my mom pins her atheism to, which is interesting. Um, but just, just to sort of, like, wrap that up, this, this notion of don't break the chain is, like, is breaking the chain of Judaism or keeping the chain going is almost the like tenet of what it means to be a Jew is keeping the chain going. And that does mean keeping up the traditions and maybe marrying a Jew and don't break the chain. You don't want to be the breaks one who the one who breaks the chain. And even on top of that, to add some of the, the famous Jewish guilt to it, think of how terrible the Holocaust was and how everybody's always trying to kill the Jews. And your ancestors who like survived all this you would be like spitting on their grave to to be the one who breaks the chain. So it's an even an extra layer of sort of guilt and this kind of like you have an yeah. obligation to continue the thing. Right. Um, and that's probably really what's going on in Ben's mind. And frankly, that's probably what's going on, not just in Judaism, but with a lot of just normal psychology of religion and continuing to be religious. There's the, the theological aspect, but there's also this whole psychological continuity of community that that we need to talk about. In Judaism, it is exaggerated to a to a, you know. If I had to say like what what are the tenets that I grew up that about Judaism, it's that that I just described of this chain and not breaking it, and then the never again that we've already brought up. That is the like that is the thing. The never again becomes the like rallying cry and the you know the equivalent of the highest prayer that you can sort of deliver in modern American post Holocaust Judaism is this like reverence of never again. Uh, like with my Hebrew high school, we went to the Holocaust Museum in DC, I remember, to like visit it. Like this becomes not just part of the story, but in some ways the whole story. And then Israel, to finish that sort of punctuation, which is huge, becomes the like, that is all of that being said, is why Israel is so important and is, you know, talked about as a miracle that there's a place for the Jews that is safe, etc. You know, it is a direct result of the horrors of the Holocaust. Is no, that it's not, though. There is Israel. Well, no, I'm, sa I'm saying what you get fed in, in sort oh. of 
in Judy. Of course, you know, Balfour and the, the movement started before Israel the Israel predates the Holocaust. Of course, of course yeah, it yeah. does. But but what you get fed in is that like it's it's all connected. It's all sort of like the Jews are always persecuted and we needed a safe haven and like this is the one. Um, so be, so criticizing Israel, even as a Jew, becomes very delicate because it's a fine line between supporting Israel, whatever that means to someone, and being Jewish, becoming totally synonymous things. In fact, Pew did a, did a poll, I don't know how recent it is now, but it was fascinating, asking American Jews what it means to be Jewish, which would also, I, I want to ask you guys about, about Muslim, but what it means to be Jewish, and it's something, you know, they, they, they had a list of things that you could select. One of them was supporting the state of Israel, which polled in like the 50%, if I'm going to get it right, if you find it. Um, but also like, like keeping kosher was pretty low, uh, believing in God, pretty low, believe it or not. Like all, all of these kind of other traditions, um, some of it was like liking Jewish humor becomes a thing or liking Jewish food, like these kind of things. Like what does it mean to be a Jew is a complicated thing. But This is U.S. Jews, Israel, by the way. U.S. Jews, yeah, it was a particular I can culture. tell you what my experience is when I, I interviewed a lot of Jews in Israel. I can yeah. tell you that, um, that Judaism has historically had three different definitions, right? Mm -hmm. Well, three merging definitions, not different definitions. But there's a new fourth definition. And mm -hmm. the reason why it has three definitions is because this is not, this wasn't unique to Judaism. All religions that pre, uh, before, well, most religions before Christianity were ethno-religions, right? So um, there were Christianity... Well, Judaism was revolutionary because it separated a religion from a from a geography for the first time, a major world religion. But, mm. but after they exiled, usually when you exile people, the religion also you know disappears or something. But they managed to keep it by being very obsessed with practicing it. Um, but Christianity was revolutionary because not only it, it separated the religion from a land, it also re separated religion from an ethnicity, right? But when the Romans started becoming mm -hmm. Christian, not just the Jews, and Islam followed that model. So like, Christianity and Islam are the first two global religions. But before, before uh, you know, before Christianity, most religions were ethnic religions. Like Judaism was a religion for the Jews, the Greek gods for the, were for the Greeks, the Roman gods were for the were for, for the Romans, the Persian gods were for the Persians, the Egyptian gods were were for the Egyptians. So you had this mer this. This trinity of you know the religion and the ethnicity and the the geography they're just all basically work together the politics and everything just just it's just merging with each other so when that's why Judaism and Zoroastrianism for example I, I I feel the same thing with Zoroastrianism in Iran like a lot of people think this is our identity this is the religion for our race this is the religion of Iran not not this Ar uh, Arab religion for example that a lot of racism comes from this from from that is Islam so. This is why, you know, when it comes to Judaism, you know, the identity is partly religion, partly ethnicity, and partly also the culture, right? Because, so there's three different definitions, ethnicity, um, religion, and culture. But the fourth most recent definition, which is people are really trying to force uh, um, and it's working is that it's a nationality. Uh, mm. It's Israel, right? So you like you can even see that in Israel now people are saying that you could be an Arab, but if you accept that your Israeli identity, you could be a Jew, <laughs> right? Uh, like what the hell is going on? Like because they really want to make it see, make Israel a Jewish country, and we were like, well, what about your Arab citizens? And they're now saying, well, they could also be Jew Jewish if they accept their Israeli citizenship. This, this so is Israeli really, citizenship and Judaism is becoming a thing. You know, this is really no. This is really really interesting because to, to bring it back to my childhood again, I was, I was you know an angsty teenager and a uh, very liberal family, very secular liberal family, and all you know parents former hippies and all that. And then Israel was this one thing that felt like total hypocrisy on the part of my parents as I'm becoming sort of a political minded human as a teenager. And so, of course, as a teenager, I would just like pick on it and be like, why can't I talk about that one and take these very contrarian sort of points of view. But my, where, where it sort of manifests is that I would, I would hear what I described in my last answer as very overtly that the biggest threat to the survival of Judaism is something like interfaith marriage, where I, as this teenager who was maybe able to see my parents a little better than they could see themselves, 
and notice this hypocrisy would answer almost the, what you're getting at there of, no, the biggest threat to Judaism is the hypocrisy of values that I'm clearly seeing here. Of the, I, I mean, it's a really interesting analysis you gave. Of, if Judaism is going to be this open, global, non-ethnic kind of, um, I don't know, liberal-minded, almost social justice -y thing that my parents wanted it to, to be, but then you seem to be in promotion of this very... <laughs> right wing, almost ethno state to define it. That's right. That felt like just total hypocrisy to me yeah. as a teenager. And I'm like, that's the thing that the center won't hold. And that's the threat to Judaism. And the kind of shit that I get from other Jews from even, and listen, I support Israel, but for the kind of criticism of saying like this cartoons, I, I don't see the anti Semitism or putting out the challenges I have. I'm already getting kind of the noises that you get of people accusing me of saying there's good Jews and bad Jews. It's, so, it's like the parallels so, to the stuff that you guys get yeah. of good Muslims and bad Muslims is just alarming to me. Of like, oh, this, that, is the way, this is the way Judaism ends. Go ahead. That is very interesting you say that because actually it's not interfaith that they worry about because and then if you ask a lot of them, they're, not, they're talking, well, they're more worried about the culture and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that, they're talking about inter-race inter marriage, right? Which is, it, so... I mean, you know, when I was getting it more interfaith growing up. It was yeah, like if but, you marry a Christian, and then you know, I don't. Yeah, know. I mean, it sounds though a lot like what the alt right is worried about: the white race disappearing because of <laughs> in, because this interracial is, marriage and yeah. stuff like that. And they also, yeah, I mean, a lot of them are asking for an ethno state, but to defend them, I um, ethno states make sense if your race if your race is being targeted. You know what I mean? So I, I don't think an ethno state for white people are, doesn't make sense because white people are not being put in camps and stuff right now, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody's hunting them down and trying to commit genocide or uh, other than the what, loose definition of what uh, white supremacists have defined as genocide, not that, but the real genocide, nobody's, com you know. But, uh, but I do think that if a certain race is specifically targeted mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, for mistreatment, then in only in that case an ethno state makes sense so i'm that's why i think the formation of israel made sense as an ethno state but to keep it as an ethno state doesn't make any sense anymore because jews do like are welcomed in the united states you know they're welcomed in canada well, the, the, like, this goes no, to your... no holocaust is happening anymore right. so keep, creating an ethno state as israel makes sense but keeping it an ethno state doesn't this, make sense. this goes to your point of the so also in my upbringing uh the adl the anti-defamation league was a constant source of calling everything anti-semitism this is not in my experience again this is not new the phenomenon of people everybody calling everything anti-semitism the ADL would do this all the time, and it was almost a joke because of what you just said of like, are we are we being persecuted again still? Like the victimhood narrative of like every Jewish, even holiday is like, there's a funny joke in Judaism of like, every holiday is the same. It's they tried to kill us, we survived, let's eat. It's right. like the same fucking thing. It's like Passover, every single one is the same story. Even like Hanukkah becomes like, it was a miracle we survived. Every single one is this victimhood story. And if you lose that story, that becomes, if that becomes the central tenet of what defines you, mm. that's a dangerous thing because it becomes, wait, if anti-Semitism is actually, you know, if the Holocaust is over and anti-Semitism is actually not this like ridiculous threat, all the time like well what then binds us together what what, right. what holds us together and that 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 that's becoming sort of a a, da a danger in the sort of like definition of what it means but everybody it, uses that not just the jews right like when i think like I, like i think at 20 i'm hoping 20 years from now when ex-muslim situation is a lot better i think our community is going to keep telling people that we're still being going you know, to harm even though maybe we're not yeah, 20 years old. This, is but, not, this is not unique to judaism but what is unique as you pointed out is that there is an actual holocaust and so the claims are very very salient and maybe or there was and maybe rightfully so very salient and like you're saying so now how do we like how do we i'll give you another personal anecdote from my family because there's real there there's costs to this that become uh very emotional like we're speaking a little bit esoterically but i want to bring it to like a personal a personal thing again i, I had an uncle uncle david great uncle he survived how the auschwitz uh, very strong until the end of his life with like a strong dude probably the only reason he survived he was really strong and a good worker his entire family was killed in Auschwitz the entire family he was the only survivor of it and I remember 
at a family gathering when I was a teenager still talking to him about what he remembered there. He was pretty young, and, but he remembered a lot of it. And he told me what he did after the Holocaust was over in Germany. You know, Auschwitz, uh, he was liberated and his entire family was dead. And he was like, I am moving to Israel. There's nothing left here for me, right? Your entire family's dead and this is a country that's a mess. I'm moving to Israel. This is the place to go. He mm -hmm. moves to Israel. And as we all famously know, like it's formed and on day one, they're at war. And he told me, you know, sitting there, he told me that he had a ton of anger in him and he joined the military and he just wanted to kill a lot of people. And he killed a lot of brown people. And he said this, he's like, I just wanted to kill people. And mm -hmm. that's fucking terrible, right? And and later in his life, and he's, he's telling me this as an old man, there is, he knows this is awful. Mm -hmm. But in some terrible fucked up way you can understand the psychology this isn't to excuse any of it of course yeah explaining <laughs> things doesn't mean excuse explaining <laughs> and excusing are two yeah. different things yes or promoting right we need like a yes. we need to just scroll all the time right but mm -hmm. the psychology of anger and what are you going to do go kill all the nazis like no the people in front of him where he was given a gun were brown people, were Palestinians, and he killed a bunch of them. And th like th the psychology of that is is very real. Obviously, we hope that that has dissipated. But you can you can map Uncle Dave, who's now dead. You can map my Uncle Dave onto the global conversation of Israel in a way that is that maybe brings it back to like you know again we're talking sort of intellectually here, but so emotionally charged and and real. Um, and maybe not in in a helpful way. Maybe that's what gets us into trouble. But um, yeah, you, you bring up maybe in this weird way, this does tie it back to like AOC because it's become this this card that you play on the table that that is is unbeatable because it is so emotionally heavy. Like, how, what was I going to do sitting there? He knows it's terrible, Dave. But he's like, they killed my entire fucking family. What did you expect me to do? Um, it's just like yeah. a psychological wound that Jews so, and Israel. Like people people who go through horrors are often. Ali, they do can that. you I mean, stop? Can you do the thing in the back? Can you stop blurring your background? <laughs> yeah. You look, oh man, you look great. Yeah. I, I, I thought I'd get 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 away with it, but yeah. okay. So so I wanted to uh, ask. If there's a third tier to this, right? So there's like attacking Judaism and Jews is one thing. Or well, attacking Judaism and attacking Jews is actually two very separate things. But then you have um, a criticizing Israel. But now you've got this Netanyahu element. Okay, so right. Netanyahu is like Israel's longest-serving prime minister, right? And um, that cartoon specifically called out Netanyahu. Uh, Netanyahu has done actually something amazing um, for. And it, it's if I was an Israeli, I'd be very upset about it. Uh, the U, the U.S. always almost unconditionally supported Israel bipartisan Democrats Republicans everybody did the Netanyahu has kind of played his way you know when he came and he addressed Congress and all that uh, he has divided you know he, the support from 100 percent Democrats and Republicans to basically now you know he he kind of went and gunned for the Republicans I have no idea why I also he, I predicted this as a teenager with my he, parents who were super liberal hippies I'm like do you see Israel aligning itself with the far right here like that's it's been no, no but yeah. it's not even the far right it's just that he cut his support in half you've got a yeah. hundred people supporting you um and and they're all going to their uh you know their their um what do you call them? The word's not coming to me. They're, they're, they're constituents, right? And they're talking to them. They're like, we support Israel, support Israel and everything. And then this guy comes in and he guns it for the Republicans, pisses off the Democrats. And now you have basically, you've cut it down from 150. So that, that's one thing. But the second thing that he's doing is that he doesn't say it out loud and overtly all the time, but he is gunning for a one-state solution. He's expanding settlements, doing all of that. He wants a one-state solution. Now, Victor Lieberman, you know, the guy who runs with him, he's mm -hmm. also like a hardline kind of guy. Uh. Now they've fallen out of it but you know it, i don't it, think he, wa he wants to set his quo the yeah. one state solution would end israel as a jewish state so th that's what i'm trying to say so he's got a i i have this thing that i think that it netanyahu in a way criticizing when people say criticizing netanyahu is anti-semitic netanyahu may actually be a bigger threat to israel than mm -hmm. uh, or the survival of israel as a jewish democracy than mm -hmm. even iran because if you have a one state solution Arabs have a higher reproduction rate, right? They they will become more than 50% of the population. So you have two choices. Either you give all of the Arabs a vote, right? In which case you have another Arab country, 
right, along with all the right. other ones you have. Uh, if you don't give them a vote, right, then you remain a Jewish state, but you're no longer a democracy. So Israel, in time, this is, this is what they call the demographic time bomb, is that in, in time, if we keep going with the settlements and we keep going with, you know, the one state trying to go with like one big great Israel, uh, it's not going to be, it can be Jewish or it can be a democracy, can but I, it can, can be I, both. Can I pose, I mean, no, it's, it's great analysis. Can I pose, and I agreed with all of it, but can I pose a like, question like back to you guys in a way of, because when, when I started very recently deciding, like I, I need to talk about this stuff a little more, a lot of it was, um, because of a lot of the things I was seeing coming out of the ex-Muslim community specifically about right. coming to Israel's defense or attacking anti-Semitism in a in a just a very quick um, <laughs> way that to me as someone maybe who grew up with it and a little closer to it feels like and felt like an overcorrection of almost performing some oh, sort I of agree. like yeah. exorcism of like I need to perform to myself and my former self and maybe my family members or my former community that that they are wrong about this and Israel is not the devil but inadvertently they they end right. up overcorrecting and calling things out and and again inadvertently i think harming because as it wasn't a joke saying if the new york times wanted to give david duke any more ammunition about the conspiracy that jews control the world they just did a great fucking job by canceling this <laughs> no, so it's like not the, a joke Right, like like the pile on by which puts me in danger, right? So like the pile on that ex Muslims join of like criticizing that cartoon or whatever. I'm not saying you guys in particular um, actually is doing a disservice to Jews and and putting people like myself in in more danger by but by, by this kind of behavior. So I wanted to like I wanted to throw it back in your direction a, l a little bit to hear your experiences. As with what, with what, yeah, with what you heard about Israel growing up or whatnot, that may have been different than what I heard about it. I gave you sort of my view of like you, you put Armin, you actually put it perfectly of like this was a necessity. Maybe Israel does some evil things or some bad things, but what would you do given these circumstances? This is a necessity, and you have to support it. You can criticize it as a Jew, but you have to support this, um, or else you're you're not a Jew. You just don't understand sort of like what Judaism is about. Um, that that's that's how I viewed Israel. It, you know, I didn't even get to like that. I, I went to Africa instead of Israel as a teenager, where all of my other friends were going to Israel. Birthright funded by Sheldon Alderson. The entire machine is built to 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 establish a connection between American Jews and Israel in an emotional sense, especially in their vulnerable teenage years that will last a lifetime. And this is a huge part of. And I've been to Israel many times now. Uh, this is a huge part of what it means to be Jewish is that experience. And I don't I don't know the view from your world that comes into it but and then and actually just to tie that to one more thing because the ex-muslim community that you know i'm very close with and and friends with have have no love loss for religious maniacs right <laughs> like it is it is right. no holds bar for for religious maniacs of all stripes and then i'm pointing to, this cartoon might not do it perfectly or maybe it does i'm pointing to like hey there's a religious group of maniacs that are getting a pass from you and from the entire world under right. the shield of this anti-Semitism thing that Netanyahu is very savvy and knows how to use. Netanyahu is thrilled every time this comes comes up because mm -hmm. I would contend that, as I pur purported to do before, that these are necessary pawns in the game to literally move into the settlements you know, to do this kind of thing. If you zoom in really close on the election map from 2016 in Brooklyn, a place famously that has more Hasidic Jews than than uh, Israel, where I am right now, you can see the red communities and you can guess who lives there. Like the, mm. these are people who are, are it's not, it, maybe it's a secret to ex-Muslims who aren't as familiar or close with it, but this is not a new conversation for me as this angsty teenager in Judaism. So it seems to me that, that there's a group of religious maniacs, I know Armin, you're not guilty of this, but that are getting a pass from a, a large segment of the ex-Muslim community that seems yes. like performative, Kind of like, look how much an, of a of a non former Muslim I am. I love Israel. Like, yes. Israel. Can I? Can I? Can I? Can I? Can I, yeah, I, I do an okay. This so, is like a, yeah. This is a good good question. So this is a lot of ex like within the ex Muslim scene, especially from what I've noticed, because I am very active right now in the Iranian ex Muslims and atheists, and and they 
basically they have positioned themselves because we grew up with Israel is is the devil. Like Israel is like the worst thing that you could possibly be. like. We don't even hate Yazid and Iblis <laughs> as much as we hate uh, Israel. Like they teach, they try to teach you, right? Um, when I actually landed in Israel, like I actually I had a moment of shock. Yes, mm. even, because I was like, nice. I'm an. <laughs> I, well, I'm actually in Israel. Like I couldn't believe it. Like we were in a taxi. We're going. We're gonna go to our place, and they, they were just chatting. And I was just looking at the window, and I kept every every ten or for fifteen minutes. I was looking at guys. We're in Israel. Like I couldn't believe it. Like oh, they have just taxis and car. Like this is like you know, like there's people don't like it's. So, I know. I knew I should have gotten over that because uh, I mean I'm an ex-Muslim. I'm an atheist. I you know. But I, I just being in Israel after so many years of brainwashing that this is the center of all evil. Mm-hmm. was very weird for me like just everything is normal and we're just driving in a car like, in israel like a holy i actually have a video of that that i'm gonna post that at some point mm-hmm. but let me tell you so i'm gonna actually show you a uh so the the overreaction to that is that the people that are now have uh, given up on islam in iran outside of iran iranians for example uh, and they hate the islamic republic of iran they hate the government they now have a position that they love israel yeah. And they love everything about Israel. And I'm not, uh, just to show you guys, I'm not making this up. This is a poll. Um, let me know when you see it. Mm-hmm. All right. So this is a, do you see it? This is a poll by, yeah. a, rel- by a woman in Chador. So because she's in Chador, you know that she's religious, Iranian from Iran, right? She's saying that, um, a, she's saying a group of um traitors to Iran, like Iranians that are traitors, are using the hashtag Iranians love Israelis. Okay? Mm-hmm. And then she says um, that we know, but we know that friendship with Israel is, is, a, is a crime. And then she says, I am, be, be sure that most Iranian Muslims uh, do not agree with this. Uh, what do you think uh, about um, Israel and the, and then the first option is uh, I I hate Israel which got 19% poll 19% result and the second option is I love Israel mm. and 17,900 people voted this is 18 or around 18,000 Iranians voted and 81% responded that they love Israel <laughs> right yeah, and so, and that was one nine like 19% said they they hated it 19 sorry what did i say 19 percent say they hate israel eight one said they love israel so yeah. majority of people they said iranians they said the uh, and again this is not this is not scientific twitter twitter users are a little bit more liberal um iranians right so but just take take this with a grain of salt but it does show that there is a major pushback at least like and i'm not saying take these numbers as if they're uh, they reflect everybody but um but just it just it just shows and and the thing is that in i in a show i had in persian in an atheist republic persian show i uh, to, uh which atheist iranian watched that show right i told them like look these are the problems with israel right like these i went to israel uh religion is making a major comeback in their politics mm-hmm. uh the religious community is using like forget the Israel Palestine side. Like the main threat to Israel is not Palestine. <laughs> the main threat to Israel is the Jew- the Orthodox Jewish community right. in Israel, right? Yes. There was a great article in the Wall Street Journal about that. That the real challenge in Judaism is secular Jews versus religious Jews. Yeah, right. yeah. and they are winning. They the Orthodox Jews are the minority, but they are so clever. Mm-hmm. They are going after two main things. They're going after the army and they're mm-hmm. going after the kids. Okay. Wait, wait, can, can I pause you one second, right? Right there like what you just said of the like the even the tone of the voice of like they are so clever talking about religious jews this is where the alarm bells of anti-semitism go off and that like I, oh. i'm not accusing you of you but i'm just telling you like i heard i could hear i could hear my mom <laughs> in the back of my head being like oh like is he saying like you know they're these so jews clever. are like so sneaky and like <laughs> they, 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 this is why it's become so delicate because you said nothing <laughs> wrong it, it, as you know and maybe people don't even know this like the simple struggle over like religious jews don't uh, basically right. live off of the state in israel and don't have to join the military comes up every now and then where the secular jews are like this is bullshit i'm going to die 
and fight on the front lines for well, you to live in a fucking settlement. Well, this was like, the biggest issue struggle. in the recent elections, right? In the recent yes, elections. Well, it, recent, it comes yeah. up. But but Netanyahu, back to that card. Netanyahu is a very sad. Can, can I respond to that before you move on? Yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. Because the Christians, the Christian um, fundamentalists in the United States are also being more clever than the secular. Yes. Like like the the thing is that the religious people they get together, they get organized, they get political. They try. Look, they got they voted for Trump even though he wasn't really Christian, but now they're getting Supreme Courts, you know, you know, right. justice. And, like they, 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 these atheists and these secularists, they, they have their numbers. They are like they're growing, and they're like, oh, I'm not going to join a movement because it looks like too much like a religion. I'm not going to create a community because oh, I left religion because I didn't like these things. Why should I join a community? Why should we get political? Well, get, well, great job. Now they're winning. That they're, they're getting together. They're organizing and they're taking the, the Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood is another example of a, of a thing that organized while dictators were in powerful uh, in power and. The only elected, democratically elected leader of Egypt ever has been uh, Mohamed Morsi, who was the leader of the Muslim but, uh, Brotherhood. My so. point is that religious people are right now with the lower numbers. They're winning globally. They're winning in Israel. They're winning in India. They're winning in the United States. They're winning in Malaysia. They're winning in Indonesia. And we're just sitting back and we're just so happy that our numbers are growing. When our numbers are growing, but it's not giving results because we're not organizing. We're not. I, I, I couldn't agree more. But Jay, anyway. Well, yeah, I, I was going to, I was, as you were in that answer about the religious Jews in Israel, um, this, this brought up like a question of the word Zionism. Cause like, I, I also wanted your take of what you, how you define it and how you heard it defined growing up. Because I heard Zionism growing up as a overtly religious position. I know it has shifted a little bit. Like you can. It, was never religious. It started completely secular. It can be. It can be completely uh, secular. I'm, tell, no, I'm so telling. I'm telling you. How, yeah, I disagree with that. But anyway, we'll get to uh, that. But go ahead. Finish what you're saying. The, there is a secular version of it. We. Can, I mean, I don't feel like getting into the Balfour Declaration and all that, and going around and getting signatures. But uh, the word Zionism, if if it's if it's as benignly defined as um, a, 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 the Jews should have a home state and a Jewish state, and that's it, and we need it somewhere, great. If that's Zionism, like that's one definition of it that is, is defensible, I guess, or out there in the world. And if that's the definition, sure, like, fine, call me a Zionist. Um, but if the definition is the Jews should have a home state and it's that particular piece of real estate in Palestine because of, or the Palestinian mandate at the time, uh, because of historical ties to it, blah, 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 that's another version of it. Or biblical third, ties to it, no. Yeah. Or yeah, or like, they, they, yeah. they pick they yeah, they pick Uganda. Also, they also yeah, considered they, Argentina, Uganda. Yeah, a place. Herzl, that, uh, yeah, Herzl who was an atheist. Actually, entertained that, but then that's what it was, I'm saying it was secular. But it was the Russian Orthodox uh, uh, Jewish community that opposed it. They said no, it has to be in biblical Israel. Yeah, so. well, well, started, because because the third the third definition of Zionism, and frankly, the one that I heard mostly growing up, although I'm willing to like whatever words change. Is is an overtly religious one of the chosen people in the chosen land, and that's that's our land, and that's the end of the story for purely religious reasons. Um, there's now okay if that word has shifted. There's parties in Israel called you know religious Zionist parties who get whatever kind of votes you want. So maybe if you need the word religious Zionist in front of Zionist, like whatever, whatever you're going to define it as, they exist. These people exist, Armin. I'm sure you you yeah, yeah. met some of them. They exist who say like God promised us this land, and that's why we're here. Um, they're the ones who are being, imagine Israel or the entire Jewish conversation around Israel if they didn't exist. If you just like suddenly all of those religious Jews, religious Zionists did not exist, how would the situation on the ground look? And I think you would have to be really, really silly to not see that it would look much worse, as Ali was suggesting, for Netanyahu and his... Mm -hmm. And his plans or his hunches or whatever kind of situation he wants without those people, right. Israel would look quite different. If you ask me quite better, uh, maybe you would be closer to a two-state solution. I don't know who the hell would go live in the settlements that you're building. There's all kinds of different conversations that would happen. Um, and, and those are the people specifically that have influence, again, over. It, show, it manifests itself in American politics and clearly through 
Netanyahu and the political parties in Israel. That's what, again, back to that cartoon, I think it maybe, again, not perfectly is commenting on, but trying to comment on. And my challenge stands of criticize that pipeline that I just talked about, which at the end of that pipeline is crazy religious people. Criticize that in cartoon form without being called an anti-Semite. Well, I used to say, go ahead and publish it in the New York Times. Now, now apparently... They're not going I, to, but... They're not yeah, going to. Yeah, so that's an interesting to. challenge. It's like, yeah, you make, make a cartoon, right, that criticizes... Um, Israel, Israeli policy, and all that legitimately, right? And specifically, the role of the religious Jews community in Israel, yes, on on the on the government, and then that sort of pipeline that comes yeah. down and has because to- actually, even even to sharpen it even a little more, and maybe this is what that cartoon is trying to do. People have interpreted the the Trump wearing the yarmulke in a lot of different ways as like a fake Jew. Does he even know he's wearing it because he's blind, et cetera, et cetera? People probably do the same thing with Netanyahu as like he's pretending to really care about those religious Jews, but really he's probably a a more cynical, just power hungry politician. So it's like, is the Jewish star that he's wearing as the dog there also a little bit tongue in cheek? Like if an Israeli secular Jew in Israel had drawn that, they probably would have drawn it very similarly with that kind of analysis that I'm I'm giving. So Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's almost even more... Uh, yeah, it's criticizing See, the, the it's very maybe sim- that everybody's using those Jews rather than and maybe this is the way yes. they get out of the conspiracy. The conspiracy would no. be and the anti-Semitism version would be like those Jews have hypnotized the world when really it's like they're the pawns and being used by all these much more savvy politicians. In this case, Netanyahu, clearly not Trump as savvy and just following blindly. That's why I found the cartoon effective, actually. So, so uh, you know, this is very similar to. I mean, a lot of what you're, a lot of the criticism that you're asking for is coming from secular yes. people in Israel, yes, right? Yes. A lot of atheist activists, secular a- activists, they are terrified about the direction that Israel yes. is going right now, and, and they the are cons- results showed. Yeah, 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 and they're constantly attacking the Orthodox Jewish Jewish people within their own country. So. The thing is that, you know, I, I joked before going on there, I went to Israel and collected a lot of license before, uh, you know, I have a full bag full of it now that to be able to talk about. But they, they told, I asked them, like, hey, do, you're, an, you're a Jewish person, secular Israeli, you're attacking these people. But when I, talk, when I say the same thing you're saying, people say that, oh, you shouldn't say it. And yeah. do you think I should be able to say it? And they're like, yes, please talk about it. Talk. Oh, we need more attention to this, which is very, sim- is f- very similar to what people come to us as ex-Muslims, and they they say like, look, I want to talk about Islam, but I don't think I can. You should. You're an ex-Muslim. Yeah, you should be able to talk about it. I think that's bullshit. Islam is bullshit. Everybody should be able to say Islam is bullshit, right? Yeah. So this this idea that oh, the secular Israelis they get to criticize uh, or I mean they're trying to. We they they're trying to save their country. Secularism yeah. is under attack in their country. Mm-hmm. I know. And we when we at when we pointed out to it, we pointed out they put like, oh, this is anti-Israeli, so it's anti-Semitic. And it's actually pro-Israeli because <laughs> you're addressing the most the greatest threat to and, Israel. And hopefully, as a, and, and hopefully, and this is where the danger is. Hopefully, also pro-Judaism. If Judaism becomes so, actually, to bring this back to like again, my how's it pro-Judaism? In, Well, no, no, I mean, this is where it gets complicated, but to bring it back to my upbringing and even in the introduction of like, do I call myself a Jew? Do I use it? Can I escape it? My last name is what it is, is like my my name growing up as a as a very (laughs) Jewish last name. um, I didn't like it and I still don't like it because it precedes me in conversation and certain political conversations. And so I started to resist calling myself a Jew, again, in my teenage years and then beyond, because I felt that it was um, advertising a political position about a certain country in the Middle East that I didn't adhere to. And that felt like, oh, Judaism's actually in trouble, because I I don't feel comfortable calling myself a Jew at this point. But if it's an ethnicity, if it's this, it's that. So, like, to your point, if, if Judaism is going to survive, it can't become synonymous, as you were saying, with a nationality or the policy of a of a nation. But why or does Judaism have to survive? I mean, wow. I understand this sounds like this sounds like the uh, white people that are saying like, "Oh, we should be against race, but race, I, race I, mixing." I, 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 I'm yeah. with you. It's a, the, the the argument from them is is again back to that breaking the chain of like, well, if it doesn't survive, you're sort of like 
doing this disservice to the people who like survived the, the Holocaust. In the Holocaust yeah. right. it's, uh, we had a okay, conversation. But, no, can I can I add this? I really want to address this because the po- the problem with Holocaust and genocide is ho- people being harmed. Okay, yes. it's um, not me- we're not. We're not trying to preserve race. We're not the races that come and went. The if the way that they go is the problem, not not the fact that the races are not there anymore. If a race is being erased by people, erased by people being harmed and killed, or you know, yeah. you're cut yeah. or something like that, that's a problem. If race is just net organically disappearing because people are just having sex with each other, what the hell is wrong with that? Uh, What's I'm, I'm wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. I was but trying that, to find yeah, a, Jason, I was trying to find a tweet from my my mom because we were talking about or not a tweet a text from my mom we were talking about this recently and she i can't find it but she she like understands all of this intellectually so she actually to give you like a little bit of her uh theological story she's an atheist and always called herself an atheist and pins it very specifically this is actually an interesting point to the holocaust and she she tells me she remembers reading a story about the holocaust uh as a teenager late teenager of some terrible story of like some nazi picking up like a Jewish baby and swinging it around just for fun and like smashing it into a tree or something. Just like some like awful, stupid, evil for no reason Nazi. And she tells me, she remembers reading this and thinking, no God would allow this, I guess I'm an atheist. Like this was her point of like, oh. And frankly, and this is sort of a, an awful irony, I think the Holocaust made a lot of Jews atheists yeah. for the same kind of thing out there. Of there like, was oh, a wait. drawing on the wall in one of the uh, one of the gas chambers. Uh, if you know, if I what was it? What did it say? Like, if I if I, if, if I something die, against God. Yeah, yeah, something. I'll look it up. But go on. You, you look it up, but it's basically the same sentiment as my mom. Like any God that would allow this, like I'm out. Yeah, or something. Yeah. So, um, but but mm-hmm. to to so like she knows all of this intellectually, and she she knows like Judaism won't survive, like whatever, you know, like all religions will will deteriorate and resurface in some other fucking way, whatever. But she, in her text to me, she used this word. She was like, I can't stop sort of like engaging in the traditions and going to Shabbat in the community without feeling like I've amputated a part of myself. And she used this word like amputated, and this. In this way, that I, that actually was again psychologically kind of like wins that part of the conversation for me. If I'm going to try to convince her to like not call herself a Jew, like that's that's actually just not ever going to happen. For me, it's much more complicated. And you have to also, I am one generation removed from the Holocaust more than her, and the next generation of Jews will be another another. Right. I mean, I think it's probably going to be no surprise that in a few generations of Judaism, when you play mm-hmm. this out. The, the the disconnect between a lot of I don't of know this, right so, now there people are asking for money because of slavery so I might still it might come back in a big way so yeah, I, 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 I find the phrase I, find themselves at the bottom of of the totem pole that I guess it could yeah maybe. no the fr- if the phrase uh, this was carved into a mm-hmm. concentration camp uh, on a wall it says if there is a God he will have to beg for my forgiveness yeah, yeah. right right which yeah. is perfect so, yeah so yeah. I wanted to like I actually because you that question about our upbringing and everything mm. so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about like in, in saudi arabia um, i used to draw like six pointed uh, triangles <laughs> stars of david just to piss people off so if there was like a matawa who made me angry and he, once i remember i was playing a guitar in the garage i was waiting for my dad to come to the car so i was waiting in the garage I was playing guitar and it was apparently prayer time and the saudi guy came and just yelled at me that you know why are you playing guitar it's prayer time you should be at the mosque so i just told him i was like oh i'm hindu and then he just looked at me and he walked away. Uh, but there was, and then I I remember uh, you know doing something where I would draw a star of David, just where I knew that he'd find it and it would piss him off. So I mean that's how much they hated it. I wrote in my book about how you know we were yeah. making snowflakes and. But this kind of psychology you just talked about is is basically manifesting itself with the ex-Muslim community. In some ways, maybe they're performing live on the internet because they know other people might see it of like look how look i put an israeli flag they're trying to trigger they're trying to trigger their muslims that are like they're trying to basically they know that this is the most demonic thing that they could show them or support so like i'm gonna it's kind of like a trump vote where a lot of people voted for trump just to piss off some other people a lot of people are pro-israel just because to piss off the people that they were always no but that that i mean this is when i'm talking about when i was like 10 or 11 years old no but so i was uh i i just knew that this is something that pisses him off i didn't really know what it was all about i didn't know about israel that much i didn't know the history um all that i learned that uh, in a very rude way and again that's in the first chapter of my book i'm not going to get yeah, into yeah. that here so 
So we were, and and when I grew older, I mean the the thing that the, the biggest grievance that they had uh, about Israel was its formation, like just the idea that they went in. Uh, that they, you know, this was yes, they were persecuted. You know, a lot of people said that yes, they were persecuted. That doesn't mean you go into another land, throw millions of people out of their homes, and mm-hmm. then, or well, I think a, a million people out of their homes, and then, uh, you know, build your land there, and they can never return, and then you occupy them on top of that, and you know, all all this stuff. So that was the issue. That was the injustice, which I still think. I think that that was an injustice. I think that that is a history of many many countries. It's happened that way. They were formed that way. I think it's been seventy years. I always point out to people in Pakistan, they always complain about Israel's formation. I always tell them, no, well, Pakistan was formed the exact same way. I mean, you had an exchange of people, but there were still, there were 14 it's, million people. You know, Pakistan's country their- based on religion also. It was yeah, based and, on religion. And also have, have their religious symbol on the flag, just like Israel. So. And yeah. yeah. He did around the same time, 1947, 1948, right? So, so there was this, uh, th- this idea that a lot of people, a lot of Hindus, Sikhs, non-Muslims were displayed. They had to leave their homes in what's now Pakistan, and a lot of uh, you know uh, Muslims left their homes in India, and there was a lot of violence, a lot of people killed. So it, it's it's a very very similar thing. So that's not unique. The, the point mm-hmm. is now it's here, and obviously it has a right to exist. Uh, so. Now I think the grievances are mainly, you know, it was about the settlements. But what we were taught, we were taught a mixture of this whole thing about Jews are evil. You know, Jews own the media. Jews have a lot of money. Uh, don't trust the Jews. Uh, Israel is a country there, and and then America supports them. And the question was, why do you think America supports them? They don't have oil like Saudi Arabia. They don't have anything else. They don't have a lot of like a, a, amazing resources. So why does uh, America have? Uh, America put Israel. sanctions on Israel at some point. Do you guys know that? Well, yeah, but but the point is like uh, just generally there was a lot of support and a lot of it has to do with the you know the second right. coming of Christ and has happened there. Yes. So over forty percent of Americans believe that Christ is going to come back and he's going to come back in Jerusalem and that all Jews have to return to Israel for that to happen as a prerequisite. So they want the Jews to be used as pawns to return. Of course, yeah, they're all going to be exterminated. But, but we haven't even talked about the religious maniacs on the Christian side who are very pro-Israel who seem Christian to also science, be yeah. pass in this. So in this I, kind of thing. Yeah, and so th- that was the issue. I think that uh, with the Zionists, there was a big thing about uh, Judaism. Now, here's the thing. Judaism was a religion of God. This was a religion of God, so we don't have anything against Judaism, but the Jews have forgotten that, and they've become Zionists, and Zionism mm-hmm. is anti-God. And and people, that was the whole thing mm-hmm. that, uh, that I grew up with um, at, at this point. But I did realize that, yeah, with ex-Muslims, there's some of them who are so pro-Israel, yeah. even though, and they're, you know, completely, they're completely oblivious to it, and I feel like it's an overcompensation. And, like, yeah, I think right. it is too. And let me give, yeah. like, okay, we've, we've like, we'll, we'll, we'll do the, the lip service of the, the, the pro-Israel things, because as Armin, Armin said, you just got back from there, it's a beautiful place, yeah. and all, all the famous one-liners are true. It's the only place in the Middle East where it's, like, it's totally safe to be gay, and all yeah. this, you know... It, it's, it's a low a standard, democracy. though. The neighbors yeah. are low standard for... Yeah. I, I yeah. also wanted one interruption. Sorry, Armin. But uh, the first country to give Arab women the right to vote was Israel. Right. As well. so, so all I'm not of, overcompensating. All of, yeah. I have a lot of problems that's with it. But that's, <laughs> yes. all, 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 of, all of that is, um, is true. And all of mm-hmm. that is why, again, yeah, like the performative of being pro-Israel. That's, it's great. Like Israel, Israel is, is doing a lot of good things. My crit, my my thing with it is 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 just very specific of like of of the criticism of a religious sect in it and a religious uh, you know minority that has undue sway and undue influence because of the cover that we're talking about with that if you, if they get criticized you get called an anti semite is there any way to do that no one seems to be able to be parsing that in any way that is getting away with it. In, right. even in American politics, and then and then I don't know if Armin, you went to Ramallah. Yeah, I did. There. Yeah, and it's and it so like the interesting thing about also which we haven't even talked about the right of return. So of course there's the Nakba as as yeah. they call it of of the disaster of the formation and all that. Um, call it you can't you can't call it that in Israel by the way. You can't call it the Nakba when you're in Israel, but you could call it that. They certainly can call that. I don't know if you saw some of the graffiti there too. There, you know, there's some interesting graffiti in Ramallah that has. Stars of David that are sort of mixed with swastikas and like it's pretty overt. Some of the yeah, yeah. or if you saw the wall, everyone famously, of course, on the wall on the Israel side is totally clean. The Palestinian side is like totally graffiti. really graffiti and really interesting stuff actually. But uh, to to what 
the people that, that I also have the most sympathy for here in this entire conversation and maybe also show some of the overcompensation that we see in the ex-Muslim community is if you're in Ramallah and trying to at all express any kind, of, as a Palestinian, to ex express any kind of nuance that may even be remotely perceived as pro-Israel, that that is that is very much out of bounds. I mean, that's like worse yes. than being an atheist there. And the the the, the even atheists are like that. Even the yeah. a Arab atheists in Ramallah agree with that. What you're yeah. saying right and, now. Yeah. And they yeah and they so they're they're the ones. I mean, honestly. I've been in a lot of places in the world, and I, I, it's hard to find someone who, on an individual level, I would sympathize with more than a secular, atheist, liberal-minded Palestinian in Ramallah. That right. is like an impossible position to be in for this, because it becomes immediately just, right. yeah, it, if you're even, even if you try to do the kind of work you guys are doing of just being critical of Islam, you immediately get called sort of like part of the secret service of Israel. Like, clearly, that's what you are. Oh, yeah. So the, the, the like the performative aspect of ex-Muslims being pro, very pro-Israel might also be a signal to those people of like, you know, it's OK to do that or, or you have friends here or whatever. Like, obviously, the psychology here is pretty complicated. And the only point that I'm trying to make out is there's a there's a group of religious maniacs that are that are getting it passed because of this behavior, right. uh, and and there's real cost to it. There's that there's actual real cost to it that we've all seen. So, right. it, it's like a fairly specific thing, but hard pressed to not see it as a modern day blasphemy taboo at this point to criticize right. those people. Yeah, and I think it's uh, I'm really uh, um, I really do think this is going to be the next thing because I think a lot of people are waking up to the Islamophobia bullshit that this is not a real thing, and I think a lot of people need something for you to as soon as to even touch to be triggered and all the red flags go up in the air and deplatforming and i think a lot of people are going to start ju uh, jumping away from the do oh if you criticize islam bandwagon you're racist that has lost its effectiveness and i think now Ju judaism is going to be used as a weapon and i think just like and another tra uh, also transgender talking about anything transgender related that's also going to be a sensitive thing and i think this is going to hurt both the Jewish community and the transgender community. Mm -hmm. right? I think because a lot of people that are looking to, you know, people that have a uh, their careers are dependent on being offended, like professional, you know, their profession is to be offended. I think they're looking for the most um, hot topic, the, the most spicy stuff. And I think they don't care about transgender people. They don't, most of them don't care about transgender people. Most of them don't care about Jewish people. And they just hijack these movements and mm -hmm. they ruin these movements, right? And because they, these movements turn into to a joke all of a sudden. Like I want, you know, even if there is no Jewish race at some point, I still want the culture there, there to be around for us to observe. His history is interesting. I, I think like, but I want, I want to protect like transgender people but i think these movements these important things will turn into a joke because these people turn it into a joke and they hurt they end up hurting the movement right yeah so but but i really quickly i, I don't think it makes sense for anybody to be pro-israel or against israel right. because like what are you specifically talking about right exactly. like yeah, that's, that's like, like like who is pro-sweden you know <laughs> and anti-sweden yeah, awesome. like who is yeah. how does that no, like, like Israel's like one of the only countries. Where next time, you're right. Next time, yeah. next time somebody asks you, "Do you support Israel?" You have you ask. Follow it up by this: What, which, what, what plan? Which like what that they do. What yeah, strategy? Like, what you know? What what policy? Well, well, the answer should certainly be well, not unconditionally. So let's talk about the conditions. Yeah. That should be the answer to everything. Like, do you support America? Well, not unconditionally <laughs> like depends what the, depends what even it when does, it comes to individuals right if you say like hey do you support ali or like i support most of what he says but i'm pretty sure he said something that i don't like and i'm sure yeah. so i said something I don't like even when it comes to individuals you do not like just say like oh i i support everything this person says unconditionally no like yeah. if you do Except that with for the prophet <laughs> muhammad <laughs> if, you yeah. do, if you do not do that with individuals, yeah, how could you do that with an entire freaking country? Like, yeah, are you serious? It's, it's, no, it's, yeah, a, it's a, a, that's a great point. Yeah, right. there's a, yeah, this is a, one of the. So I, I actually a lot of my thoughts on this uh, would I wrote in an article in Huff Post, and I felt like I had to get that out, and I never felt like I had to write anything after that. And it's called Seven Things to Consider Before Choosing Sides in the mm. Mideast Conflict. I'll send you a link to it if you haven't mm. read it. But 
but it, it was exactly the point. You know, this the whole idea of being pro-Israel, anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian, anti. So I kind of parsed it. I was like, I, I, I despise Hamas. I right. oppose the settlements. I oppose the occupation. I don't like, uh, you know, the corruption that's happening with with Fatah. I, you know, all so just kind of took all of that, and um, it just turned out there's a lot of things that I like and don't like on on either side, right? And yeah. and there are there, there's obviously it's a more complicated topic, but right. just you can't get into. So one more thing I had to ask you, Jay, is because you know we're talking about all this stuff. We're talking about what is anti-Semitism, what isn't anti-Semitism. The three uh, sort of, I guess, the, the I was going to say trinity of it is Judaism trinity. that uh, that Armin talked about, that, you know, the ethnicity, the religion, mm-hmm. and the culture. Uh, the fact that all these three are sort of uh, conflated, doesn't that cause a lot of confusion? So, you know, <laughs> for instance, yes. the, the father of Zionism, Theodore Herzl, was an atheist himself, right? He wanted to entertain the whole Uganda, the looser definition of Zionism that you were talking about. Um, and then, you know, you have, if I have a... A school that's only for white people, that would be considered racist. But if I have a school that's a Jewish school, then um, you'd be like, okay, isn't that racist? And like, no, no, because it's a religion too, so it's yeah. a faith school. Now, but if it's if you have a state, it's an ethno state. Well, isn't that an ethno state? No, no, no it's a religious oh. thing. You know, there's a historical persecution. So you can there's always an out. You know, if you if you talk about religious uh, favoritism. Then, well, it's an ethnicity as well. If you talk about ethnic favoritism, well, no, it's a religion as well. If you talk about one of them, well, it's also a culture. So um, that makes it very confusing, I think, for people who want to legitimately criticize yes. any of these elements the ethnicity, uh, idea, the religion the, itself, or even aspects of the culture. Like, for instance, if, if whenever I talk about circumcision, male circumcision, um, I talk about, I always get yeah. like, well, you're being anti Semitic. So that's a cultural element and a religious element that I get. So, h- how do you, um, it's very hard not to be called anti Semitic. But, but I, before, before, be, before, yeah. before, Jay, yeah. before Jay answers that, I think this is, uh, I want to say this is why it's such a perfect, for people that, you know, they want to be professionals that be offended, Judaism is perfect. Because imagine, like, <laughs> imagine, like, when people say, as, oh, if you criticize you Islam, you're racist. Yeah. Got if, <laughs> if you want to, if you want to criticize Islam, you're a bigot. That didn't make any sense. And now they know it. But imagine how complicated that would be <laughs> if the word for Muslim and Arab was the same. Yes. They, this whole this whole mess of being anti-Islam is bigotry would have gone a lot longer if the word for Muslim and Arab was the same word, which is not. But because for Judaism there is the word for the religion and the ethnicity are the same, you could play a lot. You could accuse a lot more yes. people out of, of it, racism. Yeah. It's it's you're right. It's it's a perfect trap right. that I cannot escape. Like you, <laughs> I cannot. Can I not be Jewish anymore? Is this question? You guys can be not Muslim anymore, right? Like yeah. you get that call, you get that all the time. Like, oh, you're an ex-Muslim. You're, yeah. And there's a name for it, apostate, right. this and that. Judaism. Can I? Can I? Can I not be Jewish anymore? Can I do that? I can say I'm an atheist. I don't believe it. A fucking word in there. They're like, cool. You're still a Jew. Can <laughs> I? Can I say like I don't ever go to synagogue? I haven't been to synagogue since my probably like 15 years old. Like my bar mitzvah or confirmation. It's cool. You're still a Jew. I, I don't keep kosher. Cool, you're still a Jew. Like, what could I possibly do <laughs> to lose the title? I, I don't it's, know, and it's a perfect fucking trap of, yes. of this. In, in a way, but, it's yeah. so good though, because you come together on community rather than ideology, and you don't no. have to fear where you're. No, it's well, horrible. It's absolutely wait, 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 horrible. Wait, wait, wait. Before Armin, because he's right, it is absolutely horrible. No, it, this, it is. It, it, it is horrible. Right. But the, the, yeah. the nice part about it is that it's a community that is like just endlessly accepting of whatever. But it becomes impossible to criticize the bullshit, and it becomes impossible to parse. Wait, I want to criticize. If I'm in the same room as the crazy person living in the settlement who thinks this is his chosen land and God had a rainbow and put a bunch of animals on it and that's why we're there or whatever like this is a fucking problem if if like I can't criticize him or this or if you criticize anybody in this room you're now criticizing all of us like th- this is an inescapable trap but but to your point because maybe we're we're um, we're characterizing it a little bit unfairly that if we go back to the a limited de- definition of anti-semitism is a belief in a conspiracy theory that Jews control the world secretly, Rothschild type stuff. Then, then can you be? Is everything anti-Semitism by that, by that light? That that that's where we started the conversation with the cartoon, where I'm like, 
okay, what's the difference between controlling the world versus having undue influence of the, over the world, even if you're not the one who are actually deserved 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 influence. I think I well, call it deserved influence. I put it, I put it this way: like where conspiracy theories start is people will start asking the question, they'll see a phenomenon of policy or this or that or whatever, and they'll ask, who does this benefit? And then they go, once they answer the question of who it benefits, they think that also answers the question of who architected the policy in the first place. That's anti-Semitism in a nutshell. If I say this relationship between Israel and the, and the American politics and how, as, as Ali said, like American politicians always seem to be pro-Israel, who does this benefit? And you're like a Palestinian asking this or any other Arab in the world. And you're like, sure seems to benefit those crazy Israelis living in the settlements because it does. Mm. Then you then you like jump to the conclusion of like, well, they must have then architected the policy in the first place, which is just the illegitimate move of anti-Semitism by that definition of a conspiracy, where really we could probably explain it all with the other kind of things we're trying to talk about here of a psychological like my uncle and the and the Holocaust and all these really deep, true psychological sort of right. mess that leads to these people benefiting from this policy. But they didn't architect it. There's no Rothschild behind pulling the puppet strings. This is just. So, so that that's the move that right. maybe leads people like the marchers in Charlottesville to to make these ridiculous Jews will not replace us kind of yep. statement or whatever. It's just like, but Jews are now the New York Times canceling cartoons. Who benefits from it? You mm. start asking that, and you could be like, well, certainly seems like those Jews in the settlements are benefiting from it because now you can't criticize them in the New York Times. Well, they must have architected that. There's secret Jews working in the New York Times that are doing this yeah. kind of thing. Like th those are the moves There's where where we might be able to point and be like, well, that's anti-Semitic. But again, if, you, if the New York Times wanted to give some evidence of it, they sure did a fucking good job, which is the big goddamn problem here. <laughs> so, 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 no, no, no. So there's so many parallels to this story. First of all. The, the whole idea of can I be an ex-Jew, this is a disagreement between a, um, atheist Jews in Israel, right? Yeah. Like, you, I'm uh, my friend Roy was asked, like, he's like, I'm an, I don't want to call myself a Jew, I'm an ex-Jew. And they were like, no, you're, the other atheists were like, no, you're still a Jew. And you're like, how come this, he pointed at me, how come he can call himself an ex-Muslim yeah. and I can't call myself an ex-Jew? So this is a, this is a major disagreement among atheists, atheist Jews, right? But yeah. the interesting thing is that this is a major disagreement among atheists Atheist Hindus, mm. ex Hindus, and this is the re this is what the similarity between Judaism and Hinduism is that they're both ethno religions. Yeah. So where does the religion end and the nationality and the race and the culture begins? Nobody knows where does it start, where yeah. does one. And so this is why a lot of Hindus are saying I'm a Hindu atheist, and people are like, what the hell? That doesn't make sense. That's a contradiction. Are you a Hindu or are you an atheist? It, it and other people the are like, only no, way. Seems the, sorry, just to interrupt. It seems the only way I could. I can lose the Jew label would be to convert to another religion because then they're like, Oh, okay, cool. Now you're a Christian or whatever. If I like go through some process in some other religion that gets me out of it. But being an atheist doesn't let me get out of Judaism because they that's somehow right. co-opt that I'm, as well. I'm, that's right. I'm, because like, so uh, I'm, I'm uh, fucked. <laughs> No, but yeah. it's very. But what I'm saying is that this is a, something something that the Hindu atheists are struggling with, which shows yeah. that it's not unique. It shows that it's the nature of the religion that makes it an ethno that makes it a struggle. A lot of Hindus, Hindus can that I, a lot of ex Hindus are can I give a hopeful, like as a hopeful turn. As of course we're all atheists in this conversation, but as a hopeful <laughs> turn, in some ways, it's an admission that they know that like. That it that it's cool to be an atheist in some way, where like they want to still keep me in their club because they yeah. know that like I'm kind of smart and I kind of have my shit together, and they're like, eh. like okay, no, he's still one of us because they in some ways when the Muslim community like it's again, I you know your your experience way better than I, Ali, but when I read the title of your book, it was aspirational of, in this way, in some way of being like if you get to the point where this argument is happening in Islam, maybe that'll be a good thing, where they sort of admit that atheists are still good people or like still in the no, tribe. Was, yeah, yeah. Wait, 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 you have to wait until I finish my point because yeah. I okay, it was go ahead, finish your point. Because um, one thing else you mentioned is that you know it's good for community. I think ex-Muslims have shown 
that you don't need that for a community. I think exponents of, of North America have shown like you could build communities based on being an ex Jew. You could right. build communities based on being ex Hindu. So for people like, oh, I'm going to keep a label because we need community. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. You don't need that. You can make entire new communities and add the ex. Add the. Don't just say I'm an atheist Jew for the sake of making this clear that you have abandoned this religion. Say I'm an atheist, ex Jewish atheist. Make that popular. Make that trending. You build communities based on that X label don't not Muslim ex Muslim not Hindu ex Hindu make that a thing if you could still if you're like oh but I'm connected to the, all this thing and history well that's that's great because ex Muslim ex Hindu ex Jewish still has that Jewish thing in there shows the connection that you have with that past but you're also making it clear where you stand by putting that X right in front of it you know, we had a, we had a conversation with uh, David Silverman um, who was the former head of uh, American Atheists and, and the whole thing we had a really interesting conversation but, but he doesn't call himself Jewish anymore uh, he t- he says there's no such thing as Jewish ethnicity because it doesn't biologically work. It's matrilineal, whereas you know the way that you know the way the chromosomes come to you know it's it's fifty fifty, but it doesn't work. So it's it's definitely not an ethnicity. And then he said it's not a culture because what we talk about when we talk about you know smoked salmon and you know uh, that's the only thing I can think of fucking smoked that's salmon. It. And, 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 yeah, just just lox and bagels. He's yeah. like that's all that's all Ashkenazic. That's not Sephardic. It's not with the Ethiopian Jews. So the 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 ethnicity is the Ashkenazics and everything, but the but you, Judaism you, is only a religion. You so, find uh, I'm sure there are tons of Jews who want to still claim Silverman as one of theirs. No matter what he says, and no matter when what I say, this illustration, that's what he talked about. And there, there are many of them who were just really pissed off at him. And I, you know, and we talked about this. I did ask him. I was like, but, you know, the problem with the reason people want to retain Jew is because there is this history. Many of them are descended from Holocaust survivors. Yeah. Many of them well, have. Well, to, yeah. to this point, um, and it's a more of just a philosophical, different global conversation, is like I'm involved with, as you know, like a lot of events that I'm going to be doing this year uh, with, with a few companies. And one of them is centered entirely around the, which is a conversation that I feel like is everybody's clamoring for the need to develop secular rituals. Uh, Sasha Sagan, Carl Sagan's daughter, has a book coming out in October that I'm super excited about that is literally all about secular rituals and the need for secular rituals on just a pure sort of sort of human psychological level of rites of passage and death rituals and these kind of things but in a pure secular content without any religious bullshit with it if if we end up if if religions happen to stumble upon good ideas with it this is you know this is a complication that we'll have to deal with and but this is an open conversation of how we yeah, do this yeah. because armin i'm totally with you but for someone like my mom or so like my dad died three years ago this is an atheist like he you know but again went to high holidays and so what do we do and it's like i don't know <laughs> i don't know yeah. what we ended up doing with him was the rabbi yeah. was there and said some shit that no one believed in but it was kind of nice we covered the mirrors because that's what the book says and whatever psychologically maybe there's some utility to it it was in the context of this jewish tradition without again maybe judaism that's fine yeah maybe maybe i think that's fine no i think i I think that's i think that's i think it's more important just the dire need to develop these things i think that's about these things yeah i I honestly think that's important we got five minutes yeah i think i i I have a lot more to say i think (laughs) more people should more atheists should practice the culture to make the case that it's the belief that it's a problem, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Like, it, you know, you it, it's just like, like going to a Harry Potter convention and having fun. Nobody thinks Harry P- witchcraft is real. But you can still have fun with it. You can still go be an atheist that has a Christian culture and go to church and enjoy the church scenery. It's not the... The, those things are not the problem. The the damage comes from the belief and the supernatural and ba- the, those those uh, dogma and the superstition. That's the harm. Key. So if in fact more atheists, I think that in, still enjoy the culture, should practice the culture while openly telling everybody that they're atheists to show the rest of the world that look, I can keep the culture yeah. without the nonsense. So, right. So to, so to that point, I, I think that's really good. What I've been clamoring for is to sever because. I was trying to like really what you just said and map it onto the Israel question and the Jewish question, which is not so easy. And that's the problem with it is the like, can we completely sever the question of Israel's policies in the Middle East and behavior in the Middle East into a purely political 
question that is totally devoid of religious oh, no, conversation. Never, never, never. And that would be the goal to do that, completely sever that from that conversation. And that's been the struggle my entire life where there's a lot of people now, and obviously including Netanyahu, who want to blur that line and have, I think, successfully blurred that line yes. to where it is. You can't sever it. So now if you criticize one, you're an anti-Semite, no matter which but, one but you even, criticize. Even without, even without Netanyahu, I mean, this is one thing. Yeah, it's been going what America going does, America does something really interesting to communities. And, you know, we, we, we had Tom Holland on this podcast mm. recently, and he's, he's writing a book um, uh, that's coming out in the fall. Uh, called My favorite Dominion. thing, by the way, is watching Armin squirm when he has something to say. But go on, <laughs> yeah, Ali. Know, but, but we also just have three minutes. So, so Jay has a hard stop at, at so two. Talk so fast. Do, uh, give me uh, five, well, five so, more minutes. Make it. Yeah. Make okay. It. So, so he, uh, so Tom Holland, basically, he was talking about the Protestant Protestantization of Islam in mm. America, how it's happened in the last like two hundred years in the Western world, because suddenly, you know, like these communities, these religious communities come from their lands and then they come to a pluralistic society, a secular society like the United States, right? And then suddenly everything the, the religion becomes an identity. Right, the hijab instead of a symbol of oppression becomes something I'm wearing out of choice. Right, mm. the the, um, the Jewish thing, you know, instead of the religion, everything, everyone's an atheist. All the Jews are now atheists, and they're just sticking to their sort of their rituals because you know that that that's part of the culture and enriches a culture. And it's even happening with Muslims. A lot of Muslims in the U.S. now just look at that as an identity. This is my heritage. This is my ancestry. This is you know where I come from. This is my culture. And it's not even that much about the religion anymore. I mean, it's it's a, it's a lot of them drink, a lot of them smoke. Most of them don't like. You know, they have premarital sex, they have girlfriends, they've integrated into American culture, but they don't, they just, the, the religion is, it's there, but it's more in the background. The identity is forefront. So it's kind of interesting when that, so that doesn't just happen in Judaism. No, um, it's more sort of rooted in the core of Judaism, like the, but it's, well, it's post Holocaust a, Judaism um, is just like a unique acceleration of all of those factors. Right. Like, and so it's. So, but yeah. by the way, that was not the case yes. from right after the Holocaust. So after the Holocaust, for a while, it was taboo to talk about the Holocaust in Israel. Because a lot of people in Israel didn't like the Jews in the Holocaust because they felt like they were so weak. Because mm -hmm. they they were like, they didn't, they were, in Israel, they were asking, why didn't these Jews fought back? Like, why was there not much resistance? Really? So they yeah, it was a big taboo. Like after for a very long time, they they saw t uh, talking about the t uh, Holocaust as well, as a taboo thing. But then it eventually, uh, eventually got into the radio and it got so much attention and became a major thing to make it into memorial. But for a while in Israel, talking about the Holocaust was a taboo. Well, I, but but I, in all I, of I would Israel, or it, just a I mean, no, all of us. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I had never heard that story of it, but I would put it more in my experience. The the like the trajectory was just more of a like. We we were weak. We weren't ready for this. It, more of the never again. So the never again thing becomes obviously like a watch out for evil. Never again. But also like, give me my fucking gun. Never again. It's like we will we'll never be weak again. Was right. more of, like that's the message that I got. More of like looking. Yeah, I mean, but that's it, that's an evolution of the message because uh, the message it was pretty rapid. I mean, yeah, I don't know. it was very fast. But at the beginning, it was like fuck this shit. Like we're strong. We're gonna defend ourselves. That's the whole point of Israel. Why did this? Why the the question was why didn't these? There were a few rebel movements and like they, 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 I oh, remember yeah. there was also a gas chamber completely burned to the ground. This is why the Holocaust Memorial there in Israel is different than every day everywhere else. In mm. Israel, it's the day where that there where that place was burned down because mm. they want to memorize they want to memorialize the day that they fought back, not the day that they were the victims, right? Mm. So Israel. So and, and by the way, I I really wanted to say this from the beginning. And um, I, I just just to be fair, a lot of people are saying like, yeah, okay, so criticize Israel, fine, criticize Israel, but these people, they're only criticizing Israel, right? Like they are not. So I'm trying to defend why some of mm -hmm. criticism of Israel, even if there if there is no anti-Semitic language in it, it could still be seen as anti-Semitic because BDS. these people, well, yeah, because these people are not like. Saudi Arabia is lobbying United States. Yes. So, but so, these so people that, have that, nothing the, to say about Saudi Arabia. Yeah, just, that, everybody's that, just focusing on Israel. Right. right. That's the best point and the best, like, Corbin, and we, we, we didn't really get into it, but talking about sort of like this new rise of anti Semitism uh, that people are harping on. I think you, you nailed it. It's like 
were in this conversation seemingly dissatisfied with, with the response of just calling them anti-Semites, it's actually you just have to call them hypocrites, which is a better word, frankly, for what they're doing. It's like... Right, it, might it's a, it's an, like it might be it, clever anti-Semitism it, because it they know they be. can't say... Yeah. It, it might be, but if we define it as maybe accurately and hopefully as importantly as maybe we can do in a conversation like this about a conspiracy, then it might not be. And it might just be hypocrisy and it might just be all the normal run-of-the-mill stuff that in the, in the normal... Uh, ex Muslim conversation we're very familiar with of the bigotry of low expectations and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. of the yeah. like. So, and, and then of course that's where the performative comes of like, oh, I'm super pro Israel. It's like, is Jeremy Corbyn an anti Semite? Like, again, I'm going to like stay away from answering that directly. It depends how you define anti Semite, but he's clearly a hypocrite. And that, that seems yes. to be the word. And you that, can't read mine. So it might be coming from anti Semitic <laughs> views, and it might not. So you can't it really might just. Be. It yeah. might be, but if he and and he's aligned with anti Semites. If you say something like Hamas, who clearly is 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 uh, well, like the party line is very anti Semitic overtly, and and in the conspiracy we talked about, he's aligned with them. He gives them a pass. Does that mean he? You know, anyway, calling him a hypocrite is definitely something that we should be doing. And the hypocrisy that we see about the UN and the million sanctions against Israel and none against everyone else, right. all of that stuff should be called out. But As we should be pretty protective over this word anti-Semitism because of because oh, it's of the history. Be overused. It's going to it's coming. It's going to be overused. It's been that's overused. been around for a while, actually. No, well, it's going to because people are jumping off of other things and coming to the new things. I think like we're just seeing the beginning. I think people are going to use anti-Semitic accusations the New so York much Times to, to cancel the political. I mean, if if, if it's, it's still powerful, it's, it's like, still. Uh, yeah. Calling somebody as Islamophobe, uh, Islamophobe is not as powerful as it used to be. It's not going to get your. It's not going to get you trouble career wise. It's not going to get you deplatformed. Anti-Semitic still has that power, so they're going to yes. use that enough until it loses all its power. So at some point, they're going like this. People are still going to use accusations that could get people in trouble. So this is why I think this will be overused. Well, I, what, I feel, I feel like last, it was one last thing. Never again. One thing I interestingly in Israel, people told me a lot of people are frustrated. A lot of Israel Israelis are frustrated with their government for not calling out the Armenian genocide because mm. of their relationship with Turkey. And they said, "What ha- they say? What happened to Never Again? We are we are against one genocide, but we're not against another genocide. Uh, why are we not standing against the Armenian genocide?" So that was an interesting thing yeah, I saw yeah. in Israel. Wait, go on. Yeah, I um, yeah, I think that uh, a, a lot of the stuff uh, with. Israel criticism of Israel. I remember in the 80s when I was growing up, there was no uh, internet uh, at that time, so you didn't have people from Gaza uploading, right. um, you know, videos onto Twitter and onto YouTube. All you really had was, uh, you know, your main newspapers, and all of all of the coverage was from Israel. So people didn't really know what was going on at that point. Uh, I think anti-Semitism was overused, and I think it was exploited a lot. Yeah, uh, nobody really knew what was I'm not saying it's not overused. I'm just saying we're just. I think we're just starting to like this is this is not the peak. That's it's what a new thing. Well, now you have the internet, so it's, it's J- not a new thing. It's just we haven't reached the peak. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. So, so J- Jay. Um, you've been generous with your time. Thank you. I know that you got to run. Uh, but um, and thank you for sitting here and, and you know, Jade, representing uh, the entire Jewish community in <laughs> the world and speaking for yes. them. We really appreciate yes. it. Now we know everything. To give you an ex-Muslim license for in return for your Jew, Jew license. Oh, so you can... I think I earned that license a long, <laughs> a long time ago. You've been. You're an honorary ex-Muslim. <laughs> I'm ex something. We're joking, by the way. We we think this is ridiculous that people think that they need to have an ex Muslim friend to be able to talk about Islam. We think it's ridiculous that, like, Judaism is. Judaism is a barbaric, backward, ridiculous religion that needs to be criticized just like Islam, okay? You don't need to be a Jew or an ex Jew or anything, any other ethnicity to be able to say that. That's just a fact. Yeah, yeah. So this is true. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Not, not so, anti-Semitic. <laughs> yeah. So you know, we're ending it on a nice, like, atheistic, uh, you know. <laughs> The, the tone, so thanks, Jay. We really appreciate it. This was great, and I, I have so many other questions to ask you. But I, we, we, we could we could dive into it again. Yes, and, please. Well, I, yeah, I think man. this conversation. Yeah, I don't think we've seen the end of the madness of. I mean, oh. honestly, whatever. We, we didn't even talk enough. About, yeah, you've got notes. We didn't even talk enough about how furious I am at the New York Times and the history. I mean, like, just to end it on how infuriating that decision is. I mean, I'm a huge fan of political cartoons. And in, in, in uh, high school, I did an entire report on the history of political cartooning as this influence. I want to give a pitch to a documentary that's not mine. You guys would love it, actually. It's called The Cartoonists. 
vanguards of democracy or something. I started at, at a film festival years ago, but it's a great profile of political cartoonists from all over the world. I think it followed like eight or 10 of them. Yeah. And it's phenomenal. Like everybody should see it in light of this ridiculous New York Times bullshit. See that film, understand the kind of, it's like might be, it's a joke, right? But like that satire is like the most dangerous job in the world right now. It's fucking crazy. Of course it could get you killed and as, as we know, but it can certainly get you fired. Um, but anyway, go see that movie, support cartoonists, let them draw whatever they want. And my challenge still stands. If anybody cares to try to do it, post it, be my guest. It has to fit those criteria, criticize what I'm talking about in cartoon form, the U.S.'s relationship to Israel and specifically its religious wing nuts who have this influence. Go ahead and lampoon it in a cartoon. It's and, and that is not anti-Semitic. That, yeah, is right. not, that, that is not that is not called going anti-Semitic. to be called anti-Semitic. Yes. yes, and also watch Jay's film Islam and the Future of Tolerance. Yes, yes. yes. It's excellent. It's available on Amazon, Vimeo. The works are pretty much everywhere, and uh, yeah, it's great. Um, it's where and, where, and, where, and, where uh, can people follow you? Too. Huh? Where can Twitter, people? Twitter J dot uh, what is it J underscore Shapiro. Okay, You'll find me. That's mostly yeah. where I hang out when I'm on the internet. I've got a bunch of fun new projects coming out too this year that you could keep an eye on. Um, I, I would love it if you made a documentary on this topic. World. Yeah, I'm not touching it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to touch it on, on film. You guys do it. Armin did it. We're done. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm doing. I'm doing one. I'll give you a pitch of one that I just got the green light for that you're going to like a lot, because um, it's political. Based on a there was a, a, a zenith. Do you remember that company? The, they made TVs and electronics. Oh, yeah, they were yeah, an American yeah, company. Yeah. A Zenith factory that closed down in 1978 in Sioux City, Iowa. And there's this incredible film that was made in 1978 in the last days of its closing that has these amazing shots of the factory workers uh, and spends time with them at home and whatnot. We're doing sort of a where are they now version of it. A lot of them are dead. In, light, in, in Iowa, in light of the 2020 presidential election. So it's a lot of globalization, industrialization, automation, but on a personal level, it, yeah. using it's going to be it's going to be cool. And the original film is beautiful. So I'm working with the original director of photography, who's now like 85 years old in Sioux City, who still like knows everyone, and it's going to be fun. So I'm going to be that sounds great. So and, yeah. and we need to get together at some point and just talk about the 2020, the U.S. politics thing. Like apart from yes. all this stuff, it'll be really interesting. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So I, anyway, guys, we'll uh, thank you very much. Thank you everybody to everybody. Th th thank you. Shalom. Everyone listening yeah <laughs> shalom <laughs> salam khuda hafiz or that whatever um no ma salama. is this shabbat uh, no it's not yeah and <laughs> Bill, we see you guys next time thank you yeah, thank you secular jihadists is an increasingly influential podcast with much of its growing audience in muslim majority countries advocating for atheists secularists and enlightenment thinkers we want to reach out to more people if we reach 500 patrons we will be able to translate our shows into Arabic, Urdu, Persian, Bengali, Malay, Turkish, and other languages in these countries. Help us get there at patreon.com slash sjme.